All right, we're going to go ahead and call the regularly scheduled Planning Commission meeting for September 9th, 2021 to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. All right, very, yeah. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, can you hear us? I can hear you quite well. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, so um, uh, just for clarification, we have Mr. Uh, Rutledge joining by um, Zoom call. So um, we have, actually, we have uh, five on the dais and one on Zoom. And uh, we'll see if Mr., uh, Mr. Roth joins us here shortly. All right. <clears throat> Ms. Slidar, are there any changes to today's agenda? Good morning, yes. Item number four, four plan amendment 2104 ordinance 2129, transportation element tax amendment and map series update, public comment. And item number five, LDCT 2101, ordinance 2119, county initiated. Land Development Code, Text Amendment, Impact Fees, and its Exhibit B has been revised to include a minor revision to the proposed text amendment language found in the Land De Development Code Section 1106.2.B.3, page 5 of 7. And these changes are included in the, uh, in the update memo. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shank, anything from the County Attorney's Office? No changes, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment, and this is an opportunity to speak on something that is not on today's agenda. If you have an item that is on the agenda, you'll have an opportunity when that item is specifically heard to also make a comment. So again, is there anybody who wishes to um, speak on items that are not on today's agenda? Anyone at all? Okay. Seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment portion of the hearing and uh, go to the uh, um, first item, item number one. Uh, that is a presentation upon request, I believe, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. And um, I know we've heard this before, so what I'm going to do is just go ahead and open this up for public comment, see if there's any interest in having a discussion related to this matter. I don't have any speaker cards for it, so I don't know that there's anybody in the audience specific for this topic, but um, we'll go ahead and open it up. So I, I'd i like to, uh, I'm sorry, we need to read it into the yes. record. Yeah. I'm trying to get ahead of myself. 2102 Ordinance 2126, County Initiated Comprehensive Text Amendment, Pearl of Flood Act <coughs> Compliance Legislative. Ms. Nicole Knapp is the press, the case manager, and this be continued to no date set and to be re-advertised. Okay. So again, it's to be continued, but still um, there's opportunities for any discussion related to this matter. So what I would like to do is open it up to public comment. So item number one, is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on item number one? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close um, that item or that application. It's uh, again gonna be continued. So. Um, with that, Chair will consider a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we continue to no date set and to be re-advertised. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Mr. DeLesline, second. Any discussion? All right. Very good. Uh, I'll call the matter to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. <laughs> uh, those opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye, motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right, the next item is item number two. Um, Ms. Lidar, can you please read item number two, Manatee Ventures rezone into the record? Yes. Item number two, C-2104, Manatee Ventures rezone, Manatee Ventures INC owner, PLN 2103-0110, quasi-judicial. And is a rezone for more or less 22.3 acres generally located on the northwest corner of the intersection of 24th Avenue East and Mendoza Road, Palmero, Manatee County. 
from A1 Agriculture Suburban to the RSF2 Residential Single Family to Dwelling Units per Acre Zoning District. And the agent is Mr. Smith. Very good. Um, for, the, uh, for the commissioners, have, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. No. No, no sir. Very good. Thank you. All right. Where's Mr. Schmidt? Okay. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, uh, generally speaking, uh, if, you're, if you intend to speak on any application that is uh, uh, quasi-judicial, you, you need to be sworn. We do have a couple items that are legislative, but it might be the best thing if you have any intent to speak today to, to be sworn in. So um, if you would, please rise to be sworn in. If you don't do it now, if we're hearing a quasi-judicial, you'll have to do it before you can speak. So. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations you're about to present to the Planning Commission would be truthful and accurate? Thank you. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Mr. Schmidt, would you like to introduce your application? Sure, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Planning Commissioners. Good morning, everybody. For the record, my name is Bob Schmidt with Land Planning Associates. I'm a certified planner and I have been sworn. Um, I'll be very brief. This is a small rezone. Uh, I think, Rosina, in your introduction, you said it was 22.33. It's 2.33, it's much smaller than that. Uh, the location, these are just the staff report maps. The location of this uh, rezone is at the northwest corner of 37th Street East or Mendoza Road and 24th Avenue East. Um, this is part of a larger tract of land that was purchased by my client, Mr. Steve Reinhardt, who uh, I thought was going to be here, but I don't see him here this morning. And um, he uh, intends to split this property uh, either by certified lot split or a minor subdivision into up to four lots. That's really the explanation. It's a rezone from A1 to RSF2. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just a straight rezone. I don't have a plan associated with the application. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Very good. Are there any questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Um, is, uh, the next uh, thing we'll have is um, staff presentation, and then we'll open it up to citizen comments. So, um, Mr. Chair, who do this we have? item is presentation upon request. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that part of the agenda. <laughs> So um, uh, let's, with that in mind, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment. I have one speaker card, and then I'll open it up to the uh, to anybody else who wishes to speak. I think the name is Mr. Stephen Sharp. Uh, if you would, sir, please come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Joseph Sharp, and I have been sworn um, to be accurate and honest. So. Um, I've uh, contacted um, eight of our neighbors right there within, you know, a stone's throw or within a couple hundred feet of this property. And um, we've all, a lot of us have lived there for a number of years. I've lived there since 1993. And um, my neighbors lived there since his dad bought, built the house in 1954. And he's lived there um, since 1973 full time. And my other neighbor, Mr. Barr, um, he's lived there since 1977. Um, and uh, Don Balsam and Kevin Willis has lived there. He was born there in 1971. And um, him and his mom live right next door to each other. And, um, and Ryan Johns just bought the five acres across the street um, uh, from this property. And I talked to him this morning. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I talked to C.J. Keene a couple times, and he happens to be neutral. Out of eight of us, he was neutral. Um, seven of us are opposed. And the reason we're opposed is, A, is when they bought that track of land, um, it was zoned A1. It was one house per one acre, which every home on our initial street right there is the same exact way. Um, and that area... If it, you're probably not familiar with it, but water flows down the ditch of 24th Avenue flowing from north to south. And it swings around that corner right there and heads towards my home. And on the next property over, I've got five acres. 
And um, some people have five acres, some people have one acre, some people <coughs> have two and a half acres there. And um, there's a church across the street from our homes that's on nine acres. And um, uh, this Dr. DeSue, I didn't get a chance to talk to him this morning, um, but, um, but I will. Um, but anyways, at this point, 88% of us are opposed. And, and the reasons why is, just like I stated, we've all got a... Um, we're all used to living there, and we're all, you know, have, you know, lived there a long time. And there's a reason why we've lived there, because we all have our property and we have our privacy. And the subdivisions about a mile east of our home have been numerous here in the last three years. And they throw a ton of traffic down our road, and it's all 60 and 70 mile an hour traffic. And it's awful. I mean, you don't want to be out there and check your mail. Let's put it that way. You got to time that right. So it's it's no it's it's there's no picnic on itself. And we realize that progress happens, but in our little neck of the woods, you know, we just don't want it to happen. I mean, that property right there was 200 acres and it sat as a pasture since I've been there, and probably its whole career has been a pasture since Mr. Grimes bought it. Very and um, please, back uh, when, please wrap up your comments, please. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, but anyways, uh, a big issue, the, one of the biggest issues is the water. Coming down 24th Avenue, swinging around there, it backs, when we have more than three inches of rain, it backs up into my property and CJ's, and my neighbor CJ has gotten into his building. And we are, the county hasn't dealt with that issue since I've been there. Right. And probably many years before that. But okay. so that's right. about it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you. And just some general guidance. Uh, each speaker will have um, three minutes unless they actually have documentation that they're speaking for a group. If you could, please focus on um, items of uh, evidence, things that are specific, the things that you feel are um, uh, critical in the decision-making process, things that can be addressed uh, specifically during this process. So, so very good. So that was the only speaker card I have, but um, we're going to open it up for public comment for anybody who, um, anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application. So if you have to come forward. So, yes. Um, if you would, come forward, state your name, and that you have been sworn. No, uh, at the dais, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good, better. Uh, I'm short. Good morning. My name is Jordan Fitzgerald, and I have been sworn in. Thank you. Um, I am also a neighbor on 24th Avenue East, uh, and my husband, Thomas, and I uh, also oppose uh, the changing of the rezoning um, for very similar reasons. Uh, we live there because uh, it is uh, an, agri an agricultural area, and uh, we fear that if the area is rezoned, it will lead to more rezoning in the area, which will take away the ability to own farm animals, um, and we have a small homestead. So uh, that is our main concern, and also uh, traffic on that area. It does get a little dangerous, um, and uh, we have a dog that keeps escaping, so we are very uh, concerned about uh, how fast the traffic is going in that area. Um, that's about it. I didn't want to take too much of your time, but no, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, again, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, I'm going to close uh, the public hearing process, or, uh, portion of the hearing, and um, Mr. Schmidt, could you please come forward? I have a couple questions for you. This, this is a little bit unusual. The, the zoning doesn't split the property. So once the process is done, it's going to be a single parcel of land still, correct? Uh, upon the rezoning, yes. Yes. would have to do their review traffic certainly would we did do a traffic impact statement for this rezone application 
and four houses don't generate enough traffic to merit any improvements. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have a process to go through. Right. And not knowing that anybody was going to be here, I'll, I'll be happy to relay, get their contact information and relay their, their contact information to Mr. Reinhardt, and he can reach out to them if that's the, the – I think that they would probably appreciate that. And um, we'll, we'll try to communicate. Very good. And um, I've never encountered this. Um, I don't know that I've ever had to ask this question. Do four lots warrant a stormwater management system? Uh, it, it, you certainly within concurrency, it's part of the uh, the, the the review. Hmm. I don't know if it's uh, if it is large enough to merit a, its own stormwater pond. Yeah. But uh, if uh, I will we'll obviously be working with uh, drainage matter or drainage staff <coughs> as we go through the process. Right, and I think um, if you could, it would be wise to meet with the neighbors because. Um, I think there are some misconceptions related to the zoning of this property, how it affects other properties. Um, uh, what is the future land use in this area? It's Res 3. Res 3. Yeah. yeah. I, and knowing this was on presentations upon request, I did have more of a presentation, if, if you'd like. But it is Res 3. We're asking for RSF 2, which is well within that future land use designation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the urban service area. And it, it's certainly in an area that, that the neighbors are correct. I mean, it's a lot of... A lot of land that has been in the same condition for a long time, uh, but it's it's also on Mendoza Road, which is a thoroughfare, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the, although there's not much traffic out there now, there there may be someday. But again, relative to this application, it's not being generated by the four future homes. Okay. All right. Any any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, any rebuttal? Uh, no, other than the, what I have previously said, that we'll try to work with the neighbors. Okay. Anything from staff? I would like to include that we consider that the application is consistent with the comprehensive plan that is intended for low density. Mm -hmm. And any potential improvement going to be analyzed at time of an site plan if this is required. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close the uh, uh, application, uh, the um, hearing for the application, and I'd like to open it up for discussion, deliberation, or consider a motion. I don't know if it's worthwhile you know, stressing to the folks that are in the audience today that mm. you know, this is this is just a stepping spot. Right. You know, we're, they're, they're required to come before us to make sure it's within the, the guidelines of the comprehensive plan, which mm. has already been set, slated as future use res three. Um, it's just our job to make sure the property's in compliance. Uh, we're not approving any, anything. It's, this isn't the final say, so it's going to go before the county commission at a later hearing, and they can bring rotten tomatoes and stones at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. And I, another point I'd like to make is I, I know um, a lot of people aren't familiar with the process, so we have two documents. We have to uh, compare these applications to for compliance, the comprehensive plan, and the land development code. <clears throat> And we can't presume what the neighbor or what the applicant's going to do. Um, the applicants indicated that the intent is to split the lot or to divide it into four parcels. That hasn't happened yet. That's a process that may not be viable if, by chance, the, uh, uh, the turning it into four lots requires a stormwater management system. Mm -hmm. It may not be feasible, so they may just go to two two units. So it's it's a very uh, un, undefined process at this point. It's a straight zoning, so um, the applicant hasn't presented anything uh, specific. So as it as it's presented today, it's a single parcel of land being rezoned to, to uh, RSF 2. So, so. And, and Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Rutledge. And, and it's always kind of my simple question to say, but in the development process, when they do these improvements or changes, they now come up to these new standards that we've set up, which is uh, the modified flood uh, study, the change in obligations of landowners and maintaining water on their property. And, and it's always been the question I have is, is it gonna improve the neighborhood's water condition? And, <clears throat> and, and the answer to that is always yes. So <clears throat> the concern about the water, I think is always reasonable. Traffic is another issue, but, but in regards to the water, they cannot dump more water or manipulate the water in such a fashion that's detrimental. And, and the zoning does not change the zoning for the other people who have 
homestead animals and so forth. So I just think as a point of clarity, I wanted to make sure I, that's my expectation. Uh, agreed. Um, the uh, uh, One of the things that a lot of uh, residents don't understand is the comprehensive plan, which was developed in, what was it, 89 or, or sometime? 1990. 1990. It, it kind of identified areas of trending um, activity, and this is an area that's RSF, uh, I think it was uh, uh, res, uh, UF3 or RES3, RES3, three. Three, which is an indication, it, it's essentially a low density kind of area. I th it, it's not, it's not going to be, you know, 90 units to the acre or anything like that. It's only the maximum three units to the acre, I believe. So, um, but that's a, a plan that's been in place for a long time, since the 90s. I don't think it's changed the uh, I don't recall in this area anything changing, but so with that, again, Chair will consider a motion. Mr. Chair, um, I, I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance Number Z2104. Here we go. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Smock. Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, hearing nothing additional. Uh, Chair will call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, did you vote aye? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you. Sorry. Um, chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right. Next item is item number three. Three. PDMU 1519 paren G paren R2. Yeah. Item number three. PDMU 1519 GR2 I-75 Office Park LLC I-75 Office Park. Amend and restate zoning ordinance PDMU 1519 GR to revise the general development plan on more or less 1917 acres by adding 33,200 square feet of office space to develop to the development option C. Option A is consisting of 99,516 square feet of office space. Office B is consistent of 33,200 square feet of office space and 234 bed assistant living facility. And option C is consistent of 116 family residential units and the proposed 33,200 square feet of office space. The site is on PDMU WPST plan development mixed use watershed protection ever special treatment overlay districts and located east of I-75 on more or less, and more or less 250 feet west of Town Center Parkway on 77 Terrace East, Bradenton, Manatee County. The case manager is Mr. Um, Marshall Robinson and for the applicant here is Ms. Carol Clark and Mr. Rudosil and this is presentation upon request. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. No, no sir. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. All right, I have no speaker cards for this application, so I'm going to just go ahead and open it up to public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on item number, uh, item number three, PDMU 1519? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close the public comment uh, portion of the hearing and ask the commission, is there any need to see any additional information? No, yes, sir. Not at this time. Okay, very good. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, Chair will consider a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend approval per staff report as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion uh, for approval. Is there any? Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, we have a second by Mr. Ron. Any discussion? All right. Hearing none. The chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Like sign. Uh, chair votes aye. Motion passes six zero. Thank you. All right. Item number four. Uh, plan amendment twenty one dash zero four ordinance twenty one dash twenty nine. Item number four, plan amendment 2104, ordinance 2129, transportation element tax amendment and map series update. It's a legislative case and is um, 
County initiated text amendment and associated traffic map series update to element five, transportation traffic sub element, providing for text amendments to element five, transportation mass transit sub element, providing for an update of the traffic circulation map series, map 515A, existing roadway functional classification, map 5B, 2045, future traffic circulation, functional classification, <coughs> map 5C, 2045, future traffic circulation, right of way protection and reservation, map 5D, 2045, future traffic circulation, number of lanes, MAT 5A, future traffic circulation, designated control access facilities, and MAP 5F, future traffic circulation, a strategic intermodal system, SIS, and emergence, emerging SIS, and associated table 501. And the case manager is Mr. Neso Galeano, Transportation Division Planning Manager. Very good, and this um, application is a legislative application, which means um, ex parte is inapplicable, and um, you don't have to be sworn for this, particu this particular item to, to speak. So, Mr. Galliano, can you come up and uh, please make your presentation? Good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Nelson Galeano. I am a professional engineer registered here in Florida, a professional transportation planner, professional traffic operational engineer, and member of the Transportation Professional Certification Board at federal level. Um, I am here to present the traffic circulation plan update. Mr. Galliano, is this a required update, like something that goes on a specific cycle? Uh, the, yes, it means um, I will address during the presentation. Okay. Um, we are here to speak about the thoroughfare plan. The reasons the thoroughfare plan is needed, what is a traffic circulation plan and its relationship uh, with the thoroughfare plan, during this presentation, thoroughfare plan and traffic circulation plan ex express the same concept and will, will be used without differentiation. This presentation explains what needs to be updated, an amendment, and the step to finalize this update. The thoroughfare plan is regulated by Florida statutes and requires definition of performance standards. Our current traffic circulation plan is more than 10 years old and needs to be updated. This presentation focuses on the thoroughfare plan. How to finance the thoroughfare plan is a matter of other session. Please be aware. How to finance this thoroughfare plan is a matter of other session. The thoroughfare plan is uh, a product of transportation planning activities. It provides uh, a functional hierarchy of the major streets connecting origin and destinations. It provides uh, for the orderly development of an adequate major street system as land development occurs or as traffic increases. It allows the reduction of construction costs of major streets, um, mainly through coordination with private action and allowed, so, of course, the reduction of travel and transportation costs. Uh, it supports uh, and enables uh, private development with full knowledge of, uh, of the public in general, minimize disruption uh, of people and businesses when, when, when construction occurs, allows the reduction of environmental impacts on air quality, wetlands, historical sites, park, and other public used recreational areas, archaeological sites, endangered species, and neighborhoods. 
and it is an element of the comprehensive transportation plan, including transit, bicycle, and pedestrian modes. And that is an important thing. It's an element of comprehensive transportation plan, including transit, bicycle, and pedestrian modes. You will see later why. Why a thoroughfare plan? Essentially, uh, the thoroughfare plan promotes safer, safer travel conditions for all users, all users. It supports future development. It serves uh, areas of future development while minimizing construction costs and operational costs. And really important, it creates opportunities for utilitarian trips using other modes of transportation different than carts. It means from the multimodal approach. What is an utilitarian trip is the question. An utilitarian trip is a trip designated to be useful or practical with defined purpose rather than attractive or without purpose. Usually when you go and drive, when you drive, you have a purpose. Uh, is it very seldom that you drive uh, around without knowing where to go? When you get into a taxi, you tell the taxi driver, please bring me to this place. You don't sit on the back seat of the, of the car and say nothing. You need purpose when you travel. Why a thoroughfare plan? Again, important, really important. Uh, this is uh, the product of transportation planning activities. And essentially is uh, thinking, doing, and verifying. Thinking, doing, and verifying. Transportation planning uses the thoroughfare plan for development review. And the development review uh, mainly manage this update. Set priorities of uh, infrastructure projects and concurrency purposes. What is concurrency? Concurrency is a grow management tool that requires to have the necessary and adequate infrastructure before the development occurs. What type of infrastructure? Wastewater, pipelines, electricity, drink water, schools, park, fire stations, libraries, transit, and of course, roads. The need of thoroughfare. In 1930, the rail system played an important role in, for the region and for the county transportation system. In 1937, Florida State Road Department developed the thoroughfare plan integrating the river, road, railroad, and roadways. The next following four slices show how commercial and residential land uses have been developed in the last 60 years with expansion to the north and east areas of the county. In the 60s, in the 80s, in the 20s, and 2020. And see, I wanna, I wanna you see the, how intense is the development in the last 20 years. You see the color? and you see how the color migrate to the north and east. A healthy relationship between transportation and economic development allows a coherent thoroughfare plan to be able to address environmental impacts, congestion, and of course, to be prepared for the challenge of the future in terms of industrial activities, increase of consumption, and personal income, which implies prosperity for the county. In other words, the traffic circulation plan update promotes, uh, promotes um, consum increase the consumption of personal income pro and prosperity of the county through industrial uh, future activities. The need for it through a fair update. Oh, okay. How will we grow and how will we move? The thoroughfare plan should answer the question, how will we move considering how the future development will be? In other words, he, uh, how will we grow and how the needs of the roadway users are on the holistic approach? We need to correlate how will we grow and how will we move. 
one of the purpose of the thoroughfare plan is to migrate from efficient streets, it means from the autocentric approach, to effective streets, human-centric approach, to move, to move people in cars by means of walking and biking while protecting the vehicular capacity of the roadway system. This update is a new concept, including safety, mobility, complete street connectivity, and accessibility. We don't want to reduce efficiency while gaining efficacy. In other words, we don't want to sacrifice anything regarding vehicular mobility or vehicular travel in order to introduce um, uh, other modes of transportation like walking and biking. How will we move? That is an important question. To answer the question, how will we move, we need to understand today's methods and today's needs. The vehicular level of service, LOS, is the common standard used by the county. The, fo the focus has been essentially dedicated to describe vehicular volumes on the streets we reflect on the number of lanes. <coughs> More vehicles, more lanes. Since the thoroughfare plan should consider other components different than vehicular level of service, such as economic, mobility, and safety, complete streets can become the future methods to address today's needs. It requires another perspective in terms of mobility, vibrancy, economic, safety, and, and perhaps uh, the use of uh, complete streets scores, scorecards. Performance measures. This is one of the conditions of the update. During the last uh, 40 years, the vehicular travel and vehicular safety have been the common performance measures to explain how we move. Now, it is critical to explain how will we be moving based on today's needs. Therefore, other set of performance measures come in play to understand the challenge we face now towards the future. Different federal uh, regulation like, uh, like um, Fixing America Surface Transportation Act or moving ahead, of the, moving ahead to the, uh, the progress created the performance-based transportation program to be implemented on all, on all modes of transportation. This um, topic will be developed in the next uh, slices. How will we move? The thoroughfare plan contains the right of way, number of lanes, planning number of lanes, compatibility with freight, transit, and local and regional connections, design standard for non motorized travel, vehicular level of service, concurrency and capital planning, interaction with the surrounding land use consideration of all type of users. The thoroughfare could also include contest classification, which is not part of this update. What is context classification? This is used and the know, or that the, the, it is used to denote and define specific criteria to design transportation infrastructure by promoting safety, economic development, and quality of life. It also considers type of right-of-way user. It means the, the human element. The needs of travel at local and regional level. It means the economic element. And the opportunities and challenges each user faces. It means the te technological and technical perspective of the travel. With the context classification, the surrounding land use, the environment, helps defining infrastructure form. For example, the environment on State Road 64, Manatee Avenue, in the, in the vicinity of the Lake Manatee, is rural, with trucks, horses, cowboys, and the design parameters are totally different than the State Road 64 Manatee Avenue 
in front of this building. The context classification allows to move away from the traditional hierarchy of roads, expressways, arterials, collector, locals. This is, the, the, this is a new trade-off between access and speed, which is about moving from efficient street to effective street. Context-based design considers roadway users and land uses to improve accessibility and mobility for all modes. Focus on the types of trips that can be made provides opportunity to make the trip in several ways. How will we move? If context classification will be included within this thoroughfare update, Manatee County will experience changes on all paradigms where the automobile was the main design and planning factor. <clears throat> it is about to establish new, new priorities where people can perform utilitarian activities by walking and bicycling without diminishing the possibility to drive. The more people walking and bicycling, the less people driving. It protects the current vehicular capacity of the roadway network because people are greater than cars. It requires innovation to understand how transportation facilities have been evolving. One good example is uh, US 41. At the beginning, years ago, has been built uh, to connect Bradenton and Sarasota, the direct connection. By the time, the function of the street changed because uh, of the uh, density increase along the roadway and how it works today, it doesn't have, not too much, what the purpose has been built. The correlation between how will we move and how will we grow can be explained, can be explained with the relationship between transportation and land use. This relation should be as smooth as possible. Contest classification answers how this relationship between transportation and land use is. Florida Department of Transportation develops the transect, which explains each category for rural environment to the urban core where the road should, be, should have different design criteria. Remember the example of um, Manatee Avenue. Different speeds, different configuration, different functions, therefore different contexts. Because human activities on the rural environment are very distinctive with respect to the human activities of the urban core, speed and, interac speed and interactions with the adjacent space of the road are totally different. A again, please relate uh, Lake, of Lake Manatee with the cowboy and the building with the uh, blue-collar blue executive with ties. One positive advantage is the Manatee complete street policy. Manatee County has a regulatory frame which allows creating roads for all users based on the complete street policy. However, it's the contest classification which supports the implementation of complete streets. Let me change gears with other aspects we need to consider. This is in the way we build uh, roads with high technology. Okay, public expectations. Public express uh, co concerns about congestion, more development happening, lack of capacity of uh, roadway, and see the county as reactionary and not proactive. Public show expectation regarding congestion elimination, more lanes now, more signalized uh, intersection now, more roadway, and more safety. The thoroughfare plan supports the creation of stroke communities by thinking of streets as community places because on the streets we interact. We need to see the streets as place of interaction. We see streets as uh, tools of growth because we see prosperity around the streets. 
along the streets. We have here activity corridors. Yes, we have activity centers, but we have also activity corridors. We see the public street corridors as, as ecosystems because we coexist along the these corridors. And the street is a public right away. The thoroughfare plan supports the creation of strong communities by, by, by foreseeing problems and solve them when they occur. This is about uh, time and efficiency. This is the relationship when and how. It reduces future additional right away costs. It means it changes the perspective of being proactive to reactive. It allows the holistic network to operate smoothly, smoothly improving connectivity and accessibility <coughs> with uh, a multi-user perspective. And it creates sense of confidence for investment with the community interest. The traffic circulation plan. <coughs> the traffic circulation planning is the formal name of the Sura Fair plan. It's part of the county comprehensive plan and is, is presented in, in, the map, in the table five is last one and my map five series. For this update, we check uh, the existing and future functional classification, the new roads, the right of way, alignments, facility type for major and minor arterias and collectors and the strategic uh, interconnected system. Well, um, what we do want we, to amend with this uh, update? <coughs> to explain the Thurafer plan update, right away is the focus of this uh, uh, presentation, to make uh, it shorter and concise. It means uh, uh, right away I, I allowed us to explain to you better how is the update. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize on flexibility, the term flexibility. Uh, the alignments here on this presentation and on this update and on the plan are not definitive. It means um, uh, it requires a final alignment because on the final alignment depends on uh, land acquisition. In, it means in terms of process, uh, time, it means time, and in terms of cost. Uh, it requires also environmental issues. We, right now, uh, we consider uh, in environmental in a superficial way, and construction cost. It means it's different to building wetland or building bridges or overpasses uh, if needed. Uh, and that is the reason of flexibility. F alignment, flexibility alignment. It means the alignments to be flexible in order to, to comply with land acquisition, environmental issues, and construction costs. Uh, okay, here. This... Um, this is the adopted, this is the adopted um, right away, 20, 20, uh, 2045 future circulation plan. And this is the, the difference between, between the old and the new one. <coughs> you, see, you see some, it means, that's it, sorry, that's it, the, the, the old one, superimposed with the new one. And you see the difference. There are some uh, areas uh, uh, that require uh, more detail. In this context, uh, um, we have five groups uh, and two special areas uh, to explain the update. And let me go group by group. That is the group on number one. Um, the main, the main, uh, this is proposed toward 20, 2045. It increases um, the connectivity north-south with Buffalo and 49, um, 49 Street East, uh, east and west of I-75. Uh, and the most important thing here is um, uh, it considers an overpass on 29th Street S East, essentially because um, we will have, um, uh, when, when we have Buffalo, complete and 49, we will have pressure on, on the east-west connections. Uh, we will have also the Florida International Trade, the mall, and the, also the traffic grow along 301 
and we believe that the overpass can mitigate uh, this uh, pressure. And here you see the, the, the old and the new superimposed, and more or less uh, we have uh, the same with this update. The group number two is the Fort Hammer and so grass, so grass Road. Um, the first is the interchange study area. Let me explain about it uh, later. Uh, we have the Piney Road with a new proposed uh, right away of 150, a uh, new road, um, uh, Sweetwater Preserve, Preserve, JJ Road, Fort Hammer Road along uh, uh, from 301 to Bukai with, um, with uh, four lanes, a new alignment. We have uh, FF Road and Siugrass with uh, an updated alignment. Uh, this is a little bit um, annoying, say, in that way, because we are showing in our plan an interchange in another county. And this is essentially because um, FDOT requires uh, coordination for an inter interchange first. This is in Hillboro, but uh, this is on our update because it impacts us uh, heavily. This is a game changer. Um, to the mobility pattern of the outdoor travel um, in the north-south axle from to Laywood Ranch. Um, this is the parallel facility of I-75 uh, and, uh, and over the river. That is the reason this is really important, um, this um, uh, interchange uh, in our uh, update. If the update happens, um, probably uh, Fort Hammer Road between the interchange and Bukai will be six lanes, uh, a six lane facility. The group number three, I believe uh, this is one of the most uh, controversial of this update. Uh, it expands the coverage of the roadway system. Uh, it considers uh, uh, some environmental aspects. Um, Muholland has been for decades in the traffic circulation plan is not a new addition. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, the New Holland, I want to emphasize on New Holland because of the comments we have received. Um, New Holland, or this area, is one of the less connected uh, area in the county. Uh, and New Holland will relieve, uh, will, will relieve uh, pressure and ensure redundancy in transportation system in case of emergency, uh, accidents, and or repairs. Um, it increases uh, the connectivity and accessibility of the entire area. And again, this is the delta map. It means uh, we modify some alignments, but there are really nothing new on this uh, update, especially in this area. And let me show again the difference. We superimpose the old with the new. The next group is the, the Lakewood Ranch. We have um, Lina Road alignment. Um, we have um, 44 East extension alignment. The Post Boulevard, a new four lane facility. Uh, Rageland Parkway, with some proposed four lanes and new alignment. Um, the U Line and Burnside Boulevard alignment. and. 44 is the east-west connection in the county. This is the direct access to the beach. This is one, it will be one of the, our activities uh, corridors. It connects with um, Cortez. This is an important road in the uh, east-west uh, travel for the county. We have here also the elimination of the Tara Bridge. Um, has been uh, discussions about uh, the elimination of uh, the entire Tara connection. It means the, the elimination of uh, a, a roadway that has been built in 1994. Um, the elimination of this and uh, the Tara connection will, will imply 
um, loss in opportunities in terms of maintenance, in terms of access management, um, project ranking and founding uh, with the MPO if um, applicable, uh, perhaps also a dedication for energy uh, relief program just in case. It means uh, as is, as is, um, from the technical perspective, um, jumping or modifying from arterial to collector or to collector to arterial is okay, or from local to collector, this is okay. But uh, down ground, downgrading uh, or demoring the functional classification um, usually is not well accepted essentially because loss in opportunities uh, for maintenance, again, access management, uh, ranking funding, and perhaps uh, emergency relief programs if applicable. The group five is the Southwest County, Lake Flores. The, the, count, the Lake Flores has a, a land development code and it includes a IMG and the Lake Flores. It has a new thoroughfare between 86 and 75th uh, Street West. Um, there are some alignment changes. Um, KK Road has been delayed uh, on this uh, update. We have also the in a special area, Bradenton Palmetto Connector Study Area. Um, there are a PD and e study area consistent with the consistent with the MPO and FDOT plans. Okay. The that is an important topic also. The relationship between land use and transportation has been explained by means of the context classification. However, we need to see this relationship from the infrastructure planning perspective. This slide shows the future land use map and the future development area boundary. It shows also where the development can occur under current regulation. The area is of the future development area boundary is classified as agricultural. The black lane is the future development area boundary. <coughs> <laughs> if the future land use information is superimposed with the proposed thoroughfare plan, it's easy to identify which areas will be covered for the update. That is what we have here on, on the screen. Please note the current future development area boundary is in purple. In purple. The proposed thoroughfare plan is going beyond to the east where the future development area boundary is located. This um, final depiction shows the future development area boundary with potential areas where development is in process due to application or other planning activities. It implies the need to correlate thoroughfare plan updates with the future land use plan with a potential discussion of relocating the future development area boundary to the east and with the vision the county has for the next 20 years. Which steps action are needed to complete the update? Mm. As, as I uh, started, this update is uh, a result of uh, planning process. The development review is um, our main data source. Uh, and for this reason, we coordinate uh, a lot with the stakeholders. We have a meeting with the uh, planning tax force, and today we are here to present to you the update. We expect um, positive uh, action and get transmitted on October 21st uh, by the board and the adoption hearing in December 2nd. Before I finish um, this uh, presentation, I wanna indicate that um, our, the value of our current uh, transportation infrastructure, infrastructure without um, the land acquisition is about $32.5 billion, the existing value. The proposed value is about $41.8 billion. If we materialize in the next 25 years this plan, we will need about $9.3 billion. That is the reason of the plan. 
it means to set priorities and, and, and define the future of the county. With this one, I'm here for your questions. Thank you so much. Very good, thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Galeano? I, I do have a question regarding the context classification. That's something that I hadn't really picked up on previously. Can you uh, explain how that is uh, uh, implemented? I think that was under the section for implementation. Is that correct? Sir, we, we don't consider uh, the context classification on this update. It requires a lot of uh, uh, points to tweak, and this is not part of this update. Okay. We present it in order to understand okay. the perspective we, go, we, we wanna go through. So generally speaking though, the context classification is how the road is used, is how it's classified, is that yes, kind of the idea? Yes, it means what happened is, what happened is uh, let, let me explain in terms of planning. Um, right now, our regulation speaks essentially about vehicle travel and performance measures are related to vehicles. It means auto-oriented. Level of service, uh, delays for the, for the vehicular travel. There are almost silence in terms of non-motorized travel. The idea is to use context classification in order to incorporate the non-vehicular travel into the system in order to, have, uh, to make possible the performance-based planning and programming. It means we set, we set performance measures, we set goals for in the way we wanna move, not only for vehicular travel, but also for non-motorized travel, and with them, uh, it impacts the, the, the budgeting, and also, but also the planning exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of uh, including the context classification. But again, it's not, it's not part of this update. Right, and you mentioned, the, you mentioned two processes, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned two processes. You mentioned the, the planning and the budgeting. Yes. What we're talking about is the planning yes, portion Yes, we are talking it. about the planning. We are not talking about budgeting. So how far are we looking out in the, into the future? 2045. 20, 2045. 20, yes, sir. That's, that's, that's the plan. The, and does, does the plan as presented, does it require improvements that are shown? Is, that, is this a good indication of work that the county is going to do over the next couple of years? The navigation card we will have for the next 20 years until mm -hmm. we update in five, 10 years, depend on, mm -hmm. depend on the needs because, uh, uh, you know, the economic dictates where to go. In your experience, does, do these roads get constructed in that time frame or are the improvements done in that time frame or is it? Yes, sir, we need $9.3 billion to yeah, do that. So, so the fact that it's a plan is disconnected from the budgeting part of it. I mean, it, this is just yeah, yeah, But the, this is not disconnected. Uh, it well, means yeah. we, we get <laughs> projects from this plan to be founded. Well, the, it's not disconnected, but there's a $9 billion gap in between. It, okay, you got it. Might as well be disconnected. Um, can you, can you provide some additional information regarding the process? So um, counties, the county staff, you know, has put a lot of effort into this. And uh, you, you, I think there were a couple mentions of other agencies or, or, or um, groups that might be involved. Um, is DOT typically a party to the process for updating the, the plan? Y yes, sir. It means... Um that is a good question. The, our network, we, 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 there are different jurisdictions in our network. Of course, uh, this is part of the, the interstate system. It's, it's, we, are, we don't have any control on the I-75. Mm -hmm. uh, but we interact a lot with FDOT. Mm -hmm. um, and we interact a lot with FDOT in, in, in the FDOT roadways. It means uh, US-41, Cortez, Manatee Avenue. Um, and we set the tone in the direction we want to go. And the FDOT is partnered with us. Um, and that's the interaction we have with FDOT. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and of course, we have um, full interaction with the stakeholders. It means with developers. Uh, and they, they set, uh, again, the tone where to go because um, this, the update is the planning, is the transportation planning result of our activities in terms of the development review. And um, is the 
MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, also involved in updating yes, the plan? Yes, this is aligned. The project is aligned. It means the update is aligned with the, with the guidelines of the MPO, yes. Of course, there are details that we don't consider, and let me explain, for example, um, uh, tran no, bus, um, bus lanes uh, along US 41. Um, we, we, we are not speaking about this one right now because this is in the way we operate, not in the way we have the system. This is two different levels. One is how how will be the infrastructure, and the other how will be operated, how will be the operation of this infrastructure. Uh, with regard to the MPO, uh, they're involved in the planning part, but they're also involved in uh, some of the yes, uh, when, budgeting. Yes, what happened is um, there are um, we have a. We have a lot of data. I don't want to go in, in, in detail with the data. And the data, and we share the data with the, with the MPO. Sometimes we disagree, sometimes we agree, uh, sometimes the information came late, sometimes uh, they, it means there are a lot of uh, discussions, but yes, there are an alignment between what the MPO proposed and has on the uh, long range transportation plan and what we have here on our um, update. Okay. I've got uh, just two more quick items that I think might help, again, provide some context. So um, how are road classifications determined? Is it by the use or is it by the, um, uh, is it more of a planning element? Is it the current use that helps determine the classification, arterial collector, uh, uh, local roads, or is it more uh, looking forward to potential? Is it the function? Mm -hmm. this is, when, when you speak about arterial collector and locals, we are speaking about the function. Right. We are not speaking about the form, and we deny what happened at, at the adjacent area of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, State Road 64 is an arterial, mm -hmm. but you see what happened in Lake uh, Manatee. Oh. Uh, the adjacent road is an arterial, and, but it, it doesn't have to do with the adjacent, adjacent land use that we have here in, 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 in the core, uh, urban core. It means uh, SED function. Uh, arterials uh, are dedicated more for high traffic, high traffic, high value, high value traffic, uh, long, long, long trips. Collectors, as name indicate, collects from residential and, and go to the arterial. This is the hierarchical process to develop a network, but um, uh, this is uh, really not related with the land use. That's the, re the reason we speak here about context classification, because mm -hmm. this is in the way we integrate the land use and transportation in order to be more efficient. And um, the example you used, I, I think you mentioned Mulholland. There was a lot of communication you said related to Mulholland. Um, the classification is currently what? Um, let me see. Uh, right now, this is rural major collector. So it's a it's a collector. Yes. And that's, that's based on the the way it's used today. The way that roadway is used today. Yes, sir. Are you changing the classification? We want to eliminate the rural and urban. Okay. And we want to say collector. Just f across the board, not yes. just for this roadway, yes. but across the board. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I think those those were answers to the questions I have, Mr. Mr. Ron. Mr. Gallagher, good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Just for a quick question. Um, this update today is a snapshot in time, correct? Will there be other future updates coming before the Planning Commission to move on? To the BOCC, or is this is this it till 2045? No, no, no. no. It means uh, we, we need to update again. It means uh, that is a living document. This is a living activity. Uh, we need to tweak. Okay. Uh, we are humans. We are not perfect. We know that uh, that, that there are um, areas of improvement. We need to find consensus what we are doing, and it is possible that in one year, two years, we come here back and say, "Hey, uh, we need this update." Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 there are a lot of unknowns right now to, to say what type of updates we need. But yes, we need, by sure, um, we will be promoting the inclusion of context classification on the next update. Um, it will be, I will say, in two, three years. It has a lot of connotations in terms of many things, many topics. That's the reason we are not including right now. Our focus is to comply with the, with the um, state uh, mandate 
And that's the reason we are here updating the traffic circulation plan. Okay, thank you. Again, any other comments for Mr. Galeano or questions? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Rutledge. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Galeano, thank you for this. I, I, I thought it was tremendously uh, helpful and insightful. So first thing I wanted to know is, uh, will this be available online so I can download it and share it with some uh, people that are involved in development and transportation issues? Yes, sir. This is on the agenda. The agenda has been published. I, uh, we included uh, minor, minimal uh, corrections, uh, typos, uh, scrivener's errors, and means, but uh, yes, uh, you can contact me and I can provide anyone the information related to this update in the way they want. Okay, perfecto. And then I had a couple of other questions and, and I, full disclosure, you know, I had some involvement with Lake Flores and hope to continue to be working with them, but how much, how much of the county's roads and streets have been, have taken advantage of the Street Smart program? You know, in other words, we have this design for accommodating and enhancing and providing that. Do you have any idea how many miles of roads have been engaged in that or used that as a process? In Lake Flores specifically or in general? No, 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 just in the, in the, in the county as a whole. In other words, who's taken advantage of the scheme that we've developed? Mm, I don't know, sir. I need to, to search, but I yeah. initially will say um, smart streets, I will say we don't have too many. But, but places like Lakewood Ranch certainly are in that design scheme, if not specifically that, though, right? Yes, but uh, if you compare the length, the total length, and, and you see how long is the, what we have in, Lake, in Lakewood Ranch is uh, less than 1%. Yeah, okay. Um, the other question I had, which I am I'm very curious about, and I see a lot more in, uh, you know, I work in downtown Tampa a lot, and the, the accommodation to things like... Um, uh, carts, you know, uh, scooters, um, all kinds of, you know, singular tire transportation. I mean, there's there's all kinds of new stuff coming out, and people are using these transportation modes. I, I'm curious, in the study and in the analysis, are we making provision for the expansion, the inclusion, and the safety of kind of having those transport? You know, electric bikes have gone crazy. Golf carts have always been around, but but there's all this new momentum of travel that doesn't mean getting in your car. Is there specific detail for that kind of conduct, design, development, and use? That is a good question. And it, uh, it does, okay, you are speaking about micromobility. Yes. Um, welcome, welcome micromobility. <laughs> but the, the, the challenge of micromobility in Manatee County is the, the location where the activities are intense and Essentially, is downtown Bradenton and some streets in Lakewood Ranch and stop. It means um, we don't have really the density we need to speak to start speaking about micromobility, um, and it requires also coordination between different jurisdictions. It means it's not about what the county wants; it is about what the city of Bradenton wants and how can we interact. Um, Manatee Avenue is a good example. It means. Uh, uh, it, it will be nice if we will have a, a micromobility connection between the Bradenton downtown and, and the beach along, um, along um, Manatee Avenue because this is the more active uh, uh, connection. But uh, if we don't coordinate uh, and if we don't have the intensity we need, uh, speaking about micromobility essentially is a dream. Yeah, and I, I guess you don't have any idea what the percentage of micro mobility is as the overall transportation. I, I miss it's. We, we have be... we have some data. I I I I don't have the data on, on my head uh, right now, but um, we have from um, our mobility plan. I know uh, it was released yesterday, two days ago. Uh, about twenty, no, seventy-five percent of our trips are vehicular trips. 11% are transit trips and, and others. And we have um, be seven, between six and 7% um, bicycle and vehicular trip and by, um, while walking trips. These trips require, no, are, are um, susceptible to be 
um, to be done by micromobility. It means uh, we are speaking about um, say six, seven percent of our total trips uh, to become uh, micro micro mobility trips. In order to do that, uh, I, I apologize, but I, I, I sound repetitive what I say. Uh, we need land use diversity because micro mobility is require uh, short distance local trips. And when we have only residential, um, the, the, there are no possibility to do a trip uh, in a scooter because the distance is too long. It means we need short trips to, to, to start speaking about micromobility. And that's the reason I say uh, intensity of the activities and land use diversity. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, okay, this, I think this is a great report. I, I like the idea that we're looking that far out because I know everybody that comes in about the rezoning issues, uh, one of the key things is traffic. What are we doing? How are we doing it? So I, I appreciate your intensity of focus uh, I, I think the graphics you put together for this is very helpful for me. I like the understanding of the cubular areas of study. So uh, I just want to say thanks for this presentation and the information. And I do think it raises a question for professionals in the industry uh, around our community that, you know, intensity of development <coughs> and ease of access besides cars is something to keep in mind. So, so thanks for that. Thank you, sir. All right, any other questions? If not, we'll go ahead and go to public comment. Okay, all right, I'm gonna, I've am i got uh, several speaker cards here and um, I'll go ahead and call your name and if you would come forward, you don't have to be sworn for this uh, particular application that's being heard. Um, if you would, please uh, try to um, summarize your concerns that we can, after the citizen comments, we can either discuss or um, speak to specifically if you have specific concerns. That'll, that'll help uh, get some answers and convey some information. So um, the first speaker card I have is Patrick Bastine. If you would come forward, please. And uh, just state your name. Thank you. Sure. My name is Patrick Bastian, and I have been sworn in. Um, I'm with the Twin Rivers 29th Court East and Southern Oaks communities located in Parrish, and we were between Mulholland and Golf Course Road west of Rye Road. We oppose the change to the transportation plan exhibits B and H, page 22, because it combines Western Mulholland to Fort Hamer Extension Project with the Eastern Mulholland to Rye Road Extension Project. These projects are separate in the existing plan. The Western Mulholland Extension, which would necessitate building a bridge across Gamble Creek, would require extensive studies, engineering, and financing, and is presumably many years out. The Eastern Mulholland Extension to Rye Road is, by comparison, relatively short, inexpensive and could be completed with much less of an impact on current county plans. We are working with the county to get the eastern extension to Rye Road completed sooner and are concerned that combining the two projects into one will jeopardize that effort. We support completing the Mall Holland to Rye Road extension because in 2019 the Southern Oaks development situated between Twin Rivers and Rye Road was open. An inter-neighborhood western access for Southern Oaks was created by a Twin Rivers 29th Court East and it became the cut-through for east and southern access for traffic between Rye Road and Twin Rivers. The route was never intended to be a main thoroughfare. Its purpose is a secondary route for emergency access to Southern Oaks. It is a winding path through several residential streets and neighborhoods of young families and while on its way from Twin Rivers to Rye Road. More than 500 vehicles a day, including tractor trailers and construction vehicles, use this residential route to cut through between Rye Road and Twin Rivers, and the numbers are rising. We are facing additional development in, of Twin Rivers Phase 5 and the Reasoner properties, which are landlocked in Twin Rivers and will use our route for Rye Road access. Since Mulholland extension to Rye Road stops a few hundred yards short of Rye Road. The huge Rye Branch development directly across from us now threatens even more easterly traffic from Twin Rivers. We recently met with county leaders to raise awareness of our issues and are already working with county departments to implement measures such as traffic taming along our route. 
But most importantly, we are trying to initiate the completion of the Mulholland extension to Rye Road project sooner since it is currently not in any county construction plans. This is the only permanent solution to our problem since the Mulholland East to Rye Road project is the county's planned easterly connector road for the area, not 29th Court East and Southern Oaks. Therefore, we ask that the current plan, which keeps the west and east extensions of Mulholland as separate projects, be maintained in the new plan, not combined into one big project. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, next speaker card I have is Ed Hughley. I'll go ahead and uh, read them so you all can queue up um, for the interest of time. Uh, after Mr. Hughley, we have Jack Bluestein. Good morning, I'm Ed Hewlett, and I've been sworn in, and I'm here to speak specifically about the extension of the Mulholland Road eastward towards Rye Road. Recently, one of my neighbors, Audrey, her husband, uh, passed away. He had a stroke. It took 30 minutes for emergency vehicles to get to him, and he passed away. And this is a grave concern to us that uh, live in the community, and we think that there's a vital and a needed extension of Mulholland to Rye Road for emergency vehicles. It's a um, disparity that this hasn't already been established. That area of Mulholland has been established internally but never extended, and that structure itself, unlike at uh, Lakewood Ranch, it was never completed and should have been completed. With your uh, consideration, I would like you to seriously think about the extension of the Mulholland to the Rye Road section. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bluestein, and after uh, Mr. Bluestein, we have Lewis Barnes. My name is Jack Bluestein. I live on uh, 29th Court East. My wife and I purchased the lot in 2013, and Medallion built our home in 2014. Uh, I'm the third person here to talk about that extension from Mulholland to Rye Road. Um, right now, we're the 29th Court East is the only direct link to Rye Road for the 700 plus Twin Rivers homes already built, the 200 to be finished in the next one to three years, and 130 plus homes that will be built on the Reasoner property if that project's approved by the county. 29th Court East was marketed and sold by Medallion Homes to all users as a court the standard definition of which is the same as cul-de-sac. Our small residential street with 15 homes is not only not a court, it has now become a major thoroughfare. There are now approximately 500 cars and trucks passing through our court every day. The vast majority of the vehicles are exceeding the speed limit. Between 29th Court East and Rye Road sits 58 Southern Oaks homes on narrow, curving streets with short driveways and many vehicles. The cars and trucks are too numerous to fit into their small garages, so they line the streets. This is the opposite of complete streets that Mr. Galliani was talking about. We've met Southern Oaks homeowners who share our dismay at the current traffic volume and speed. They do not allow their children to play in the front yards due to the danger posed by the traffic, which will only increase if the Mulholland to Rye Road extension is not approved and expedited. If the Mulholland extension does not go through to Rye, the new fire station on Rye Road will mean that fire trucks and emergency vehicles will have to go down 29th Court East in order to get to any emergency calls from our court through the western part of Twin Rivers. Long body trucks and trailers cannot turn around in Southern Oaks. Instead, they travel down 29th Court East onto 162nd Street where they make illegal U-turns in the middle of the road. In short, the present situation on our street poses numerous problems for both us and Southern Oaks, but eliminating the Mulholland extension would be disastrous. Uh, we, we support keeping them as two separate projects if that will advance the uh, speed of completion. Right now, it's not in the budget to do anything on Mulholland Road between 22 and 26. We'd like to get that expedited. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, after Mr. Lewis Barnes, we'll have Mark uh, Fairwitz. Thank you. Ah, good morning. Good morning. I am Lewis Barnes, been sworn in. Appreciate you hearing me today. Thank you. Uh, 
in regards to the uh, Jones development. I just wanted to ask that the uh, night lights, because of noise, uh, excuse me, <laughs> a little nervous. I would like to ask that the, the lights at nighttime have like downward shining lights, kind of reduce light pollution, because we're used to living out in the dark. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure he's talking about the, this project. I think he means, he said Jones. He might mean Jones Farm. Is that, uh, sir, are you talking about the transportation plan or? No, I'm, I was with Jones. That's why I didn't know what Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have the wrong number here. <laughs> okay. That was just a, a test of a practice, so. <laughs> well, good. I needed some practice good. anyway. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry for the confusion. We're trying to place it and got a little confused. All right. Next. Uh, Speaker card we have is Mark Frederick. <laughs> I, I went to school in Arcadia, so forgive me. Oh, hold on. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Fredowitz, and I have been sworn in. I'm with the community here with Truen Rivers. Uh, I come from New York, so we're, um, yeah, we left Florida since we've been down here four years ago. But when we bought from Medallion Homes in Twin Rivers four years ago, it was, uh, it was a dead-end street. We, th we thought it was a cord. It's 29th Cord East, Cord. Um, now, the whole idea, which I got the 62-page report from the county a couple years ago, my wife and I were in the beginning of this whole fight that we were surprised one day to wake up and the trees are going down and what is now at Southern Oaks became a full-fledged neighborhood. What we did know was back in 14, and I may be incorrect on the dates, that that was zoned a certain amount of parcels per acre, and it was quickly made three times that amount, which increased the density without a corresponding study of what it could impact and how it can impact Twin Rivers. The impact study was done on Rye Road, how it's going to impact Rye Road, uh, but not Twin Rivers. I hate to interrupt, but we need to keep the discussion relevant to the transportation study. Well, I think it's if kind of related because it does... And it doesn't impact the whole thing why this whole group is here today. If, if you could, uh, maybe correlation, how does it relate to the transportation study? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, I'll just summarize real quickly. Uh, we get 500 cars a day going up and down our street. And the whole idea of Mulholland could be uh, an idea that our group has put forth in terms of helping alleviate that problem that we have. Uh, but the, uh, the infrastructure, let me just discuss it. I know it doesn't relate, but... It caused all of us on the street to be thrown in the floodplain because of improper studies being done back then. That's all I got to say because I'm limited to the discussion at hand. Yes, so. yes sir. Uh, your street, when you say your street, you're talking about 29th Court street. East. Okay, very good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next speaker card I have is Bruce Kittinger, and after that, uh, Danielle uh, Kubria. And that would be the last speaker card, and we'll open it up to anybody else who wishes to come forward. Thank you for the correct pronunciation of my name. <laughs> uh, I'm here to represent the 29th Court East, and I'm in favor of the Mulholland extension, the eastbound extension from Mulholland to Rye Road. That's been in the plans for over 20 years. It's been promised for over 20 years. Plans have been made of all natures based upon that con uh, connection coming into ex existence. And so I strongly support the connection of Mulholland Road to Rye Road and that the commission should consider that as a thing that will be done. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Very good. Uh, hold on one moment. What was that? He needs to state his name. For oh, the I'm sorry. Can you state your name? <laughs> Bruce Kittinger. Very good. For the record, she's uh, no problem. notes. No uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, next speaker card, Daniela Cubria. Do you have the clicker? I have a form as well, so I can, if somebody can increase my time to 10 minutes, please. Is it? Right, right here. Mr. Chair, the, yes, the um, Danielle submitted an email saying she represents six people, but I don't know whether sign off is for six people. You have that? Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
And then she's requesting 10 minutes. Okay, that's, that's fine. We're here to get all the information that helps us make good decisions, so. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Danelle Cabria. This is my son Cabria to observe today. And I've been a Twin Rivers resident since 2008. My purpose of my basis of my presentation today is that I'm asking the Mancy County Planning Commission to recommend removal of a segment of Mulholland Road as a collector road in its traffic circulation plan. I will start off by submitting a petition that I wrote and distributed for support. The petition in part reads, Extending the existing Mulholland Road from Fort Hamer Road through to County Road 675 will create many unintended consequences for residents, such as increased traffic, noise, crime, and unauthorized access to our amenities, decreased privacy and property values, and destruction of protected wetlands and habitats. <coughs> we are the residents that are directly affected by Mulholland Road. Some of us reverse out of our driveways on Mulholland Road, our front doors face, and our mailboxes are located on this road. We take our kids to the bus stop, walk our dogs, and ride our bikes down this road. And our neighborhood holiday parade routes are along this road. Every Twin River resident, new and old, use Manatee River access or are going for a leisurely neighborhood drive are traveling on or intersecting at Mulholland Road. Every resident of River Plantation and McKinley Oaks access their homes via this road. There is no impact study or staff recommendation report that can give you more answers than the residents that use this road now and as it is. As of yesterday, the petition had obtained 689 signatures of support. I validated the supporters so I can actually show the commission the support of 447 households. Half of those are in Twin Rivers that support these changes. I would like to break down a few of these points outlined in the petition into further detail. The first one is of traffic. The segment of Mulholland Road will show minimal transportation benefit to Manatee County because of its location. The traffic gridlock that occurs on I-75 moves commuters to Fort Hamer, north to south. When Fort Hamer is backed up because of multiple new and close together traffic lights or school zones, you will already be past Mulholland Road intersection or have traveled to County Road 675, US 301, or Golf Course Road to Rye Road and then on to State Road 64. This is the same in reverse south to north. Commuters would travel on Upper Manatee River Road to Rye Road whereas all of these identified roads are scheduled to be improved to four lane roadways to handle current and future capacity and will allow residents multiple options for their travel. The growth of parish as shown is primarily north and east where there is already a, approved infrastructure improvements in all of these roads. Let Golf Course Road be the four lane collector that it has always been designed to be. The BOCC just approved Canoe Creek expansion and SM Ranch which will improve Golf Course Road as part of its development plan. A new homeowner in SM Ranch will not commute perpendicular to Mulholland Road. Mulholland Road is surrounded by neighborhoods that already exist. There is very little growth to occur within the box to necessitate this connection. I am not requesting to close a segment of road that is open. I am not requesting to redirect the traffic to use another road network. My home is built. My neighborhood is almost completely built. This thoroughfare is not. All traffic uses the network of roads that currently exist and will do so more efficiently when Manatee County's infrastructure upgrades occur. It is one and a half miles from Mulholland at Fort Hamer to Golf Course Road. It is 1.3 miles from Mulholland at Rye to Golf Course Road. This easy two minute commute far outweighs any negative impacts for us and costs for the county. Twin Rivers covenants prohibit on-street parking, yet this thoroughfare will constantly have road hindrances. What about service trucks? They are too large to pull in our driveways. A landscaping truck, propane truck, delivery truck. Will I now be prohibited to use these services? My last of traffic is the fire and EMS response. Fire and EMS are located on US Highway 301 and nearby access and have access to County Road 675 and Fort Hamer. The new approved station number two will be located directly on Rye Road. Both stations would approve via arterial roadways and the shortest, most direct distance to hospitals, which are located south of Parish, not east to west. My second point is of noise. The LDC section 701.1 is to establish the minimum landscaping, screening standards, and criteria that are necessary to achieve the desired quality of life. All thoroughfares, even prior to this ordinance, have landscaping designs 
These include three canopy trees, six understory evergreen trees, and 33 evergreen shrubs per 100 linear feet of buffer with setbacks and 50 foot buffer zones, all used to mitigate noise and reduce light occurring on thoroughfares that are adjacent to residential neighborhoods. Here is Harrison Ranch Boulevard. Note the six foot privacy wall separating the boulevard with adjacent property. It also has a median, canopy trees, and shrubs. An aerial picture shows all of the reverse frontage lots. Here is Chen Road at Kingsville Lakes. Note the setback, buffer, landscaping, and fencing, and reverse frontage lots. Here is Golf Course Road at Gamble Creek Estates and Canoe Creek. It has a berm, fencing, and plentiful landscaping. An aerial picture, sorry, an aerial picture shows all of the lots are reverse frontage. Here is Mahollan Road west of Gamble Creek at River Plantation and Chelsea Oaks. It has fencing and landscaping. An aerial picture shows all lots are located within its neighborhoods and reverse frontage lots. And yet here is Mahollan Road and Twin Rivers. We are not adjacent to a designated thoroughfare. We are abutted to it. An aerial picture shows the front or forward facing lots and just three canopy trees are required on our home sites. Mulholland Road was added to the thoroughfare map in 2001, yet not functionally classified, whereas Twin Rivers GDP had unfortunately just been submitted. This timeline shows the county had multiple opportunities to offer recommendations to change this planned development with the foresight of Mulholland Road always being thoroughfare, yet dissecting a neighborhood. Recommendations could have altered the design of the lots, require additional landscaping, buffer zones, screening, and other mitigating options other than a notice to buyer received three days prior to closing. This GDP would not pass through staff review with an approval today. My third point is of crime. I ran an MCSO query for all dispatch calls to and only Mulholland Road in the last five years. There were 123 calls on this one road that is currently two miles long. That is an average of two calls per month. The most calls were noticed as suspicious vehicles, suspicious circumstances, traffic complaints, traffic stops, and trespassing. I then ran an MCSO crime mapping report for the last six months within a five mile radius of Mulholland Road. This shows 99 reports, an average of 16 calls per month, an increase of 800%. The most incidents noted were assaults, vehicle break-ins, and theft. These roadways make a trend. Easy entrances and exits, exits off adjacent main thoroughfares invite and enable criminals to enter a neighborhood, do the crime, and get away. Please do not invite this activity to our neighborhoods. This would happen with Mulholland Road connecting at Gamble Creek as well as connecting at Rye Road. We know this because we are having reoccurring issues at 29th Court each, East, which ties to the neighborhood of Southern Oaks that you've heard from my neighbors. My fourth point is of decreased privacy. Mulholland Road is in Twin Rivers, not a separate entrance into a development, not a turning lane to enter or exit. You are riding by my front door. This is where my kids play kickball in my front yard. This thoroughfare would be an intrusion. There would be zero privacy. There are 32 forward frontage homes and 36 driveways in Twin Rivers on Mulholland Road with no design thoroughfare landscaping, no sound mitigation, no type of barrier on a potential four mile straight speedway without stop signs, and we've asked for them. There is only one other designated thoroughfare that dissects an existing neighborhood and parish. This aerial picture shows Neil Holmes at Silver Leaf. It was designed as a thoroughfare only to be able to satisfy the CLC criteria at US Highway 301 so he could also zone commercial use. But also note, he designed the, the neighborhood with reverse frontage lots, not abutting the thoroughfare. My last point is that of destruction of protected wetlands, wildlife habitats, and costs. Mulholland Road Extension would have to cross over Gramble Creek. We have been told for years that the environmental studies would show an impact that would be too costly to mitigate. The existing footbridge, walkway, and dead end flood at every large rainfall. We were told a design and construction bid was done, and it came out at close to $20 million. What is the likelihood of this segment being built at that cost? There are sections in the Land Development Code now that establish the standards for development and most importantly provisions that will be harmonious with the existing communities. But what does this do for a residential neighborhood whose GDP was approved in parish during the times when these codes were made effective 16 years ago? And it isn't a plural neighborhoods, it is just one, Mulholland Road and Twin Rivers. 
Let's talk alternatives. What about severing this segment only? The growth is north and east and will be served by County Road 675. Mulholland Road extension, as identified on the map, can still be designed and constructed as a thoroughfare properly with a berm, fencing, landscaping, sound wall, etc., a buffer between the thoroughfare and any new development. And final, I hope I have taken the Planning Commission on a drive today and in my front yard, and I've shown what our home life would be like outside of our front door if Mulholland Road continues to be designated as a thoroughfare east of Gangwell Creek. Plan development zoning of a project establishes buffer zones, setbacks, landscaping, and lot design, and to help mitigate potential adverse effects. This can't be built on my Mulholland Road now, so please help us protect our neighborhood and my kids and our quality of life by recommending our changes and removing this segment for good. The rest of my presentation can be found in your agenda packet because clearly I'm wordy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, this, this isn't a sporting event that might have the opposite effect of what you would wish it to have. So um, we, we appreciate, if you have something to say, please step forward and say it. So with that, that was all the speaker cards, but if there's anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application, please come forward now. Anyone at all? We have a Zoom call? Okay. Go ahead, caller, if you would, please state your name as soon as you're connected. Caller ending in 590, please speak. Uh, yes, my name is Kathy Woolley, and I'm the Community Affairs Chairperson for Terra Golf and Country Club. And I've come to speak today particularly on the, with the goal of having Terra Boulevard not appear on the traffic circulation plan as a thoroughfare. It has never previously been a thoroughfare was always hoped to be a thoroughfare if the county was to build the Terra Bridge. But if you will look on your group four page of the circulation plan, you will note that the Terra Bridge is no longer in the county's long-term um, road plan. Our road classification as a collector should really be reduced to a local road. With no bridge at the end of Terra Boulevard across the Braden River, um, the function, not the form, and the adjacent uses and the LOS of D just really make this a local road. Speeding is a continual problem on the road. It's two lanes on each side for part of the road and then a single lane on each side on the south side. We definitely are a community place because Terra Golf and Country Club is a golf cart community with half of our community built on one side and the half on the other. We are also, to uh, let you know, a... Um, perfect uh, transportation mode because we have micro mobility. We have biking, we have golf carts, we have walking because we have on the corner of our internally focused DRI, a Publix grocery store, a Gecko's, a pizza place, a dentist, a small neighborhood services commercial center. We're right across from Creekwood and so our owners can age in place. We're not a 55 and up community, but we are a community that likes for our owners to be able to stay in the community as long as they'd like. This requires that Terra Boulevard be removed from the traffic circulation plan as a thoroughfare. <coughs> I understand the traffic department believes that this, if it were designated as a thoroughfare, that we would have better opportunity for uh, funding for bicycle mobility or sidewalk improvements. But truthfully, we have enormous amount of biking mobility because we're in sort of an intact community. We're south of State Road 70 on the north. We're west of I-75, which is on our east side. We're bounded on the south by Braden River Road. Uh, I'm sorry, by the Braden River. And we're bounded on the west by Braden River Road. We are absolutely the perfect place for weekend bicyclers on their way to Linger Lodge to have lunch and, and sit <coughs> and music. We do not need to be a thoroughfare. We do not want to be a thoroughfare. We did not appear today in our 100 red shirts because we thought our request was so simple and so effective that one of us coming to speak was adequate. Uh, we urge you, please, to look at the 2045 plan for Terra Boulevard, which includes less right-of-way, less lanes, and take this particular road require the traffic department and public services to take Terra Boulevard off as a thoroughfare. It serves no purpose. 
The reason for not building the bridge was because it was fiscally imprudent and leaving Terra Boulevard as a thoroughfare with our twisty lanes and our um, retention ponds right up against our road, a variety of reasons, and only being one half a block off of Terra Elementary School. Children coming and going all the time. There is no reason, or no rhyme or reason why Terra Boulevard should ever be, should not, is not now, should ever become a thoroughfare. We thank you very much, and we hope you'll give this very serious consideration before it's um, sent on to the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Do we have any other callers? Okay. Caller ending in 305. Please press star six to unmute. And uh, if you could, then state your name also. Hello. Uh, my name is Sarah Kenny. I'm a... Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Sarah Kenny. I'm a resident of um, of East Bradenton. We're very close to uh, the Manatee River Road in Fort Hammer. Um, and I have been seeing an increase in traffic lately uh, with with all the development plans coming. And I, I just have more of a question. Is there a master plan for all the development that's going in? Just listening to the other callers, I'm just curious um, when these neighborhoods are being put in, is there a, a, anyone looking at how these roads are all connecting, how people are going to be using the roads and anything they're going to do to mitigate traffic? And I liked what the other person was asking about um, when he was on the call earlier saying that um, we need to think about other means of transportation other than just vehicles. So are there going to be more bike lanes? Are we going to look at other ways of getting around to try to decrease traffic? Um, that's just my, my main concern right now, traffic and the, the hyper growth we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other callers? Okay. That's all the callers we have. And again, I'll open it up one more time for anybody else who wishes to come forward. Okay. Seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close the public hearing portion. I'm sorry, the public comment portion of the hearing. And, um, for the, uh, the folks who can't get up during the hearing, I'm going to go ahead and call a uh, recess so we can take a, a little bit of a break and we'll come back and we'll, um, we'll discuss a lot of the comments that were stated. So it's about uh, 1047 now, so we'll, we'll take a 10 minute um, recess. Thank you.
All right, let's uh, go ahead and continue the meeting. I'm going to call the meeting back to order. If you could, um, you could find your seats. All right. So uh, we've had the um, uh, public comment. We had the presentation, public comment. Um, I know I was making notes. I'm sure Mr. Galeano was making notes related to the comments as uh, folks came up. If if you could, uh, if you, if if you could, uh, please hold your comments. Can you? <laughs> Please, please hold your comments. Let's uh, go ahead and call the meeting back to order. So, uh, Mr. Galliano, uh, if you could come forward. <laughs> we, we're not going to ask you to stand against the wall or anything like that. We just have some questions. So, uh, Mr. Galliano, during the the um, uh, citizen comments, uh, there seem to be a lot of things that, as is in many cases, some of the desires conflict, and um, I. I think uh, maybe some additional information might provide some uh, clarity with regard to how this document is going to be used. So um, one of the things I'd like to address uh, ver very early in the discussion, there were a couple references to projects, like references to projects uh, related to Mulholland Road. Are you aware of any uh, county projects associated with improvements along Mulholland? or anything that's programmed? Mm, no. I don't remember. I don't believe right now we have um, something scheduled on the CIP regarding Mulholland. There are a lot of projects around the, the facility um, in the vicinity of um, Ray, uh, Ray Road. Mm -hmm. mm, and by sure they should intervene somehow yeah. the, co the connectivity uh, let, with Moholland. Let me amend my question. Is there anything related to crossing the, the river? Uh, the, the, uh, the idea is to move forward and connect it um, and expand the, the Moholland to the um, east. Yes, sir. Is that in the CIP? But I don't the recall. Cap I don't recall exactly. I don't believe that this is on the CIP. Okay. Means I, right now, with this amount of roadways and no, I don't have it. Sorry. So again, understanding the process, this is a, a look out to 2045. The right. um, the the uh, capital improvement plan looks out five years. Yes, sir. And that that five years is where the funding for projects comes from. Is yes, sir. That's right. Okay. And a project may consist of something such as a study that maybe happens in one five-year period, and then is there, it, it could be broke up in pieces. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, sir. It means um, um, first, uh, this is uh, the feasibility of the roadway, and it should be done by some type of um, PD&I, mm -hmm. uh, Planning, Development, and Engineering study. Um, it, it requires several disciplines. And it establishes um, essentially a design and cost of the project is feasible. Uh, it is pro one study of this magnitude uh, can be longer than uh, two or three years, depend on um, depend on the complexity. And then it comes the land acquisition that it could be also very complicated, uh, very detailed. Uh, uh, this project has environmental issues that uh, needs to be uh, scrutinized in detail, I believe. Mm. Um, it means this is not uh, a simple, easy one. Mm. And, and again, I, I'm trying to emphasize the point. Just because a roadway shows up in the uh, thoroughfare plan doesn't mean it's on a capital improvement plan for any time soon. It could be, but it, the, the idea that is, again, that this is a planning document. Yes, correct. It means, uh, uh, again, what you see on the plan is, is, is the result of the transportation planning activities based on development review. Mm -hmm. um, each road has a purpose. Uh, it ro and the purpose is guided by connectivity and accessibility. Congestion is created by lack of 
connectivity when everyone drives at the same time on the same road, on the same direction, in cars alone, mm -hmm. we have the problem. And this is one of the areas with less connectivity and less accessibility in the county. And that is the reason Muholland is, is uh, uh, the, the extension is, uh, is, is it alleviates the, the traffic congestion in the future. Right now, we don't see any any problem because we don't have development. But when the development comes, it comes, of course, with uh, a traffic of the growth of traffic and more cars and therefore um, longer trips because this is uh, essentially residential. And if uh, the um, neighborhoods, the habitants, the residents of these areas want to get some grocery, they need to drive. And the drive is longer. And that's the reason they need access and connections in order to get destinations. OK. Um, there were a lot of comments associated with the segment of Mulholland that was, um, I guess, uh, just west of Twin Rivers. Um, there's a portion of Mulholland within that community. Um, the fact that the developer has that roadway segment within their project and um, that it's on the thoroughfare plan, um, does that obligate the developer to construct that roadway? If the impact, if the project um, uh, has impacts on this uh, roadway, the, the impacts should be mitigated and it should be addressed by the traffic study. I don't have right now in my right, head the no, traffic no, I... study, but uh, any, <clears throat> any impact um, detected uh, at any traffic study should be mitigated. <clears throat> right, and, and I wouldn't expect you to have that information. What, I, what I'm trying to um, get to is that the thoroughfare plan is a planning uh, document and that the, the, the issues with the segment of roadway within Mulholland I'm sorry, within Twin Rivers, the Mulholland Roadway segment, the m more appropriate discussions would be re related to whatever the construction plans or site development plans, final site plans associated with that project. There's obligations and, and requirements through that process. Is that? Yes, that's, is, that, that is, uh, yes, that is correct. But that is not only. But, uh, it should consider also some type of, uh, for example, speed management strategies mm -hmm. uh, in order to to connect on um, form and function. Um, and that is, that is what uh, sometimes our regulation lacks. Uh, how, how is the function? Because form impacts function. You say our regulations lacks. lack. It means we, can, we don't have teeth to say you need to do X or Y in order to, to get, um, to get um, how can I say, it? for example, to manage the speed. Uh, if only if we have some safety concerns and we demonstrate that there are safety concerns. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have it. It means uh, uh, we, we need more data in order to, to work in terms of um, improving safety conditions. Right now, with 500 mm, trips a day, uh, we don't believe that um, um, high 500 trips a day will be uh, a reason of um, safety concerns. That is one of the reasons we don't see any speed management strategies or something like that. It means, uh, yes, we need to, to, to jump from, proact from reactive to proactive, yes. Right. But it, it, it doesn't go essentially with planning. It goes also with operation. And one comes after the other. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the, the point I was trying to make is that <coughs> there's concerns or, or issues related to a roadway that's a segment within a development maybe the discussion re related to the, mob um, the uh, mo uh, not mobility, um, uh, thoroughfare plan isn't the right place to investigate. It would be in Correct. the documents Correct. that authorize the construction of yes, that sir. roadway Correct. segment. Correct. I mean, this is, we, we, our um, update is at, at the county level. Mm -hmm. So these type of specificities uh, go away of, of our analysis, essentially because Imagine all roadways at this type of detail. Mm -hmm. um, we never finish this duty. OK. All right. And the, the last one I have is just kind of a question. Um, I think there's a, a perception that if you're, if you're calling a road a collector road, like the, um, the caller related to Terra, 
Terra just terminates, but um, the the uh, you know with the removal of the bridge, that doesn't change the function of the road, does it? No, it doesn't change the function. Of course so, not. It continues being a collector. So collector is defined maybe in the very um, simple terms. How would you define a collector road if somebody were were uh, if you were trying to explain it to somebody it, who wasn't technical? This is this is a roadway that allows to go from your home to a um, very uh, a main facility where you can travel uh, longer and high, at high speed. Right. That is a collector. So the <coughs> this is the transition between local and arterial. Terra's classification is Tara, related Tara to be, the roads that go to Terra, which are local, local roads, to the collector, and then it connects to State Road 70, which is Exactly. A, it means that uh, Tara... Uh, I, I don't want to use the word collect because it is... Uh, <laughs> but um, Tara groups, groups the trips of the local streets and put the trips on State Road 70. Mm -hmm. That's it, the function. And this will be a collector. You can name it wherever you want, but you know, her, this, this, its function is collector. So multiple neighborhoods um, connect exactly. to a collector. Yes, sir. Okay. Mo multiple Mo neighborhoods with local roads. Okay. All right. I just wanted to get a couple clarifications. I, I, you know, as a engineer, I deal with this a lot, and I know sometimes the terminology gets a little convoluted when when you're coming into it cold and you don't have a lot of experience. So I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions for um, Mr. Galliano? Um, I had one. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Rutledge? Yeah, Mr. Galliano. So the presentation of the report as it has been submitted is a guideline for the future. I, I hear the uh, presentation by the resident from Terra and I, I agree with her 100% because I, I use that area. I go by jig landing down there, and I snake around there because I'm not far from there from my home. And I don't see it as a successful model for completion. And so my question is this. With your current designation of it, does it make it irreversible if it ultimately is determined better solutions are there that just adding more roads and thicker, wider roads is not the solution. As I know we have to have a roadmap, but is this a difficult thing to make a different decision on if they ever get funding, if they ever design it, if they ever have a concern about it? If you, you can name the roadway the way you want. Mm -hmm. I, I, I need to start the, the statement in that way. It means uh, Tara Boulevard will be collector, you name it local or or, 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 but the function is collector. You can improve the mobility options along Tara Boulevard, um, including another mode of transportation. Um, the fact that um, it has um, jumping possibilities at the end of the roadway or at the beginning, depending on where you are located, um, it doesn't change the name it doesn't change the function. Right. Um, and um, I, I would like to add a, uh, maybe to um, <coughs> provide a little bit of, at least the way I understand it, uh, I've made a lot of uh, emphasis the fact that this is a planning <coughs> document, a planning document, and that's true with the roads that aren't yet constructed. But if a roadway is constructed and it has the right of way that's designated per the plan or per the um, study, I don't know what Terra is, but just say 120 feet, I, th I think that's what, what it is. If it's a four lane road and it picks up local, local roads and takes them to an arterial, just by the function of that road, it's a collector road, correct? Yes. It, and in that instance, it was a result of planning previously, not necessarily, it was previous documents and does, does the fact that it's classified as a collector indicate that there's a future connection? If that segment was removed from the plan, it continue operating as a collector, right? And that's so, it. You can so, remove it, but uh, it lost. It, 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 if you remove it, what happens is you lose opportunities for, for 
positive interventions in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of, um, of a multimodal holistic approach. It means uh, um, right now the roadway is an autocentric roadway. If you want to include them into a perfect transportation mode, um, you need to adequate the facility in, in these regards. Mm -hmm. uh, but if this is a local road, uh, how? Right. It, because um, the funding of opportunities disappear, essentially because of the designation of the road. Right. It means the recommendation is uh, stay as a collector uh, for funding purposes, um, and, and that's it. Right. So in <coughs> this instance, the form of the road is the designation. It's not like if you say, okay, it's not a collector, it's a local road, we're going to take right away, away from it, we're going to you know, go to two lanes instead of four. That's not, that's not uh, a reasonable presumption. No, sir. You are just correct. to, just to redesignate it. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I think what I, what I sense here is there are two very strong groups representing their understanding of the traffic flow, the needs, and so forth of the community. And I can tell you this, and and I don't feel this way. I've lived in a number of communities, but. I feel like Manatee County Commission and the staff really does listen to its residents. We're small enough still, we're not a metroplex that just does whatever they want. The, the commissioners I think are responsive. And I would just, I would really, really recommend and emphasize and tell you the success that I had in my neighborhood, not because of me, but that, that they changed the development from Neil Homes into a park down the street, 32 acres, and it's fantastic. And I, I think, you should be empowered and you should be brazen in making these representations at a sophisticated level like the first one that was presented up about the Rye Road area and also about Terra because I think this information is valued and I think it can be assimilated and I think you need to work towards the goal that you have. We have to have grit and, and fight our way into getting the things that we want because they're beneficial. So right. I think this is great information. I think this is the value that we provide as a board. Um, and I think I think having a plan is important, but I also think the input of these unique conditions and situations have to be exercised to the greatest extent and have to be presented in a way that, like they have today that are very compelling because I don't think we do this arbitrarily and I don't think the commission acts that way. And there's a lot of demands for money and design and effort, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in your neighborhood unless you want it. So I just would say that the presentations by by the public today have been very impressive and I think persuasive. Uh, and Mr. Rutledge, I agree. The the very a very good example of the commission listening to the residents and citizens is um, the fact that the Terra Bridge hasn't occurred and it's it's been removed from the thoroughfare plan. But I um, the emphasis I would like to make though is that the 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 battles need to be proper battles. Uh, I, again, I think in many cases there's conflicting um, desires, so those have to be negotiated. Um, but there's also, th this, this document's not gonna be the solution, changing this document's not necessarily gonna be the solution to every issue related to traffic. So um, I, I think, um, again, discussion, information, I'm sure a lot of the um, residents who are in this area have probably learned some things coming here today and listening to the discussion. So I, I, I um, strongly encourage dialogue and discussion related to items like this, but I, I think the, a well-educated approach is, is um, warranted for many of these issues or concerns. So uh, anything further? Mr. Galliano, I, did you have any other uh, clarifications or things to uh, um, address with regard to the, the citizen comments? No, sir. Okay, all right. All right, very good, thank you. So with that, um, I'll open it up for discussion, deliberation. I've talked a lot during this application, so uh, you know that seems to be a, a problem I have sometimes. Uh, again, being a technical person, I, um, I've had the pleasure of using the thoroughfare uh, maps and they're not always as friendly as one would hope. So, so anything further? Yeah, Mr. I would like to make a comment. I'm I'm really impressed with um, the, the lady that got this. Uh, her detail of explanation and presentation was awesome. So thank you very much for coming up and all the citizens today. 
Um, I understand where you're coming from, but as presented, this is just a plan. Um, as Mr. Galliano stated, we're $9 billion short of putting any plan into effect that would do something. Um, I do feel some of your pain. I live in Palmaire um, and uh, travel Whitfield and Honoré every day. So I understand the concerns that the citizens have with regards to bringing that thoroughfare through. Um, but um, I'm going to, uh, you know, we, we have to have a plan moving forward. We have to have a plan for traffic. We have to have a plan, just a plan out there. I would uh, encourage the public, again, to the same presentation of the BOCC when this comes before them um, and let your, uh, let your feelings known to them. But being that we need a plan for, tr uh, we just need a plan, um, and this is just a plan, and not written in stone, as Mr. Galliano said. It, it's going to change. It's going to grow. It's going to shrink. It can be added to or change. It's kind of a fluid uh, document. Um, I'm going to be in favor of moving, moving this transmittal forward to the BOCC. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ron. And, and to dovetail to your discussion, um, we're a volunteer commission that provides recommendations related to two documents. This one is actually one document, the comprehensive plan, that it's appropriate. The, um, the Board of County Commissioners can make decisions. They can also direct staff to do different things. So um, I think it's important um, that your voice be heard at the next meeting, so make sure that you do participate and continue to have discussions. So, All right, with that, uh, Chair, I'll consider a motion. Mr. Chair, I made to recommend transmittal of the plan amendment PA 2104 ordinance 21R29. Very good. We have a uh, motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Round, second. Again, any discussion or deliberation? All right, hearing none, the chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, the, all those opposed, like sign. All right, chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. All right, we're going to go on to the next item, which is item number five. Is that right? Yes. Land Development Code. LDCT 2101 Ordinance 2119 County Initiated Land Development Code Text Amendment Impacts Fee and is a legislative case. And Ms. Nicole Knapp, Impact Fee Administrator, is uh, here to present. Very good. Thank you. Um, again, this is a legislative item, so it doesn't require uh, ex parte disclosures. Um, Ms. Knapp, could you go ahead and make your presentation? Uh, good morning, Commissioners. If I could get the slide presentation. Thank you. Bless you. Uh, so good morning. As Rosina said, uh, I'm Nicole Knapp, Impact Fee Administrator, and today we're here to seek a, an amendment to the Land Development Code text amendment, text only, um, as with respects to the implementation of our impact fees. So we're asking to amend the Land Development Code, and in your packet you'll have exhibits A and B. And um, as you'll see on the screen, if I could kind of categorize the strike through and underline, the changes are non-substantial to our administrative procedures uh, or to have language that's consistent with a new legislation or consistency throughout the Land Development Code. And the role of the Planning Commission today is um, to hopefully find the amendments consistent with the comprehensive plan as I explained in exhibits A and B. What the request does not include, it does not include implementation or um, of any impact fee update study or a new fee schedule. Neither of those are part of this amendment. As you may recall, um, <clears throat> in March we presented an impact fee update study to you all and um, at the conclusion of that you had a favorable recommendation to move the process forward to the Board of County Commissioners. Between those two hearings, uh, the administration and staff had a discussion that given some changes in circumstances with some recent um, changes in House Bill 337 and changes in our population and CIP, along with the fact that we had a desire to have the study uh, make some recommendations regarding um, affordable housing and other similar, what could be similar um, small type dwelling units like your tiny homes or ADUs and the study at that time did not because the, the there just wasn't enough data so we're working um, with our consultant to do a partial amendment to this study that you had previously seen and that can take about six to eight months 
So in the meantime, there were some administrative changes we felt necessary, consistency with the statute, and you'll see one of those amendments is necessary. Um, it gives the Board of County Commissioners the option to waive or reduce impact fees for affordable housing, and we feel like that it's important to get that language in the, um, in the Land Development Code. So the first um, attachment you have in front of you is Exhibit A. That's our definitions. The, um, Definitions related to impact fees are mentioned twice in Chapter 2. It can be a little bit confusing. First, the referenced alphabetical order by reference only. There's no definition tied to it. And then there's an impact fee section within Chapter 2 that uh, defines all of those definitions. Um, so you'll see a couple stricken or um, new mentions added. And then if you turn to the definition section of impact fees, that's where you'll see most of the definitions have to do with uh, consistency with Florida statute or consistency with other definitions within the land development code and um, also helping us to implement analysis we've had to do over the last five years on uses that just weren't identified or, or defined. Mm, there we go. Uh, and then the other exhibit is exhibit B and that's where you'll get into that's chapter 11 that's the impact fee ordinance and um, in there we again if I summarized it's it's all the changes presented in front of you are to update our business processes that have changed in the last five years address the affordable housing uh, consistency with Florida statute and then consistency within the land development code and this is um, I, I didn't put all the definitions on the screen I can if you have a definition question but I, I decided to just focus on exhibit B today this here is section 1102. It has to do with impact fee determination. And this is an example of, a, of a, in advancing our business or administrative process. Not all development requires a building permit or certificate of occupancy. And some of those triggers are when the fees are to be paid. Um, so you can see we've added or certificate of completion as the case may be, just for consistency, just to make it clear for um, the public, whether it be developer or residents trying to develop their property on when the timing of fees are to be paid. Again, more of a housekeeping, non-substantial change. Uh, same with this one. This is our exemption section, 11022. Um, we just felt we needed to add, again, to advance the implementation process on our in-house side, make it clear that the, some of the burden of proof is on the applicant of when to provide appropriate documents when they're trying to apply or prove that there was a previous structure that was demoed, for example, um, and they would like to apply some sort of adjustment or exemption to their new structure. This is the affordable housing element I was telling you about, uh, the section 11086. The black text, as you see it, is what's there today. Um, previous to 70, um, House Bill 7103, excuse me, from July of 2019, we couldn't waive fees or reduce fees for just arbitrary land uses. It had to be consistent across the board. So there was a time where we put the black language into the code to allow us to, um, you couldn't waive without offsetting your loss revenues. That's the black text as you see it today. Um, currently today, if um, an affordable housing project comes in, we have livable manatee, which we can offset the revenue loss. With the new house bill from 2019, it gives the local governments the option, it's not mandated, but an option to waive or reduce, and it's a policy decision. So this red language that you see would be added to 11086, and it gives the board the process by which they would do that if they were inclined to re re waive or reduce. Um, it gives the process of it that it has to be approved by resolution. It's not an administrative function, so it would have to come to the board. And it's restriction or limited, um, it must be tied to a land use restriction agreement. This is an internal consistency uh, change to the code as well. The blue language is what's in the code. The blue stri stricken language is what's in the code today, and it's, it's very antiquated. So the red, as you see it, is consistent with other notice policies that we have within the Land Development Code for other appeal processes. So again, just consistency throughout. Um, and then last here is um, credits for system improvements. And this has to do with being consistent with Florida statute. Um, the first is with credits being assigned or transferred to adjacent benefit districts. Formerly, you couldn't necessarily uh, do that. And the second is with if there was to be an increase in, in impact fee rates, it ensures that the holder receives a full benefit for their credit. So again, we're adding these to be consistent with Florida statute. Um, in closing, staff feels the text amendment proposed in exhibits A and B are non-substantial for consistency purposes. 
procedural or housekeeping in nature, and that the proposed tax amendments is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, they also support the implementation of procedures officially adopted in our impact fee administrative manual, which once or if these amendments are approved, we would update our manual to be synced with that. So we ask that you find the request to be consistent with the comp plan and recommend approval of ordinance 2119 as shown in exhibits A and B. This concludes my report. Very good, thank you. Uh, question regarding affordable housing. The, um, Do you want me to go back to that slide? Yes, please. Okay. Um, just a real, real, real quick, two questions. Um, the resolution, is it per? Per wait, development. Per development, yeah. it can't be a resolution all, all. Blanket, across, no. Okay. Yeah. And then the, I think you said it, it was subject to a, a restriction or a condition? Yeah, no, that, that kind of further explains the answer. So it'll be per development that meets the criteria for affordable housing. And that de specific development will need a land use restriction agreement. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you, you wouldn't just arbitrarily say any and all. We want to make sure it's specific to meeting the criteria for affordable housing definition and the LURA restrictions. And the land use restriction agreement is simply a um, designation that the the units or the homes would be affordable. A certain per, percent or, in, yeah. In mm -hmm. perpetuity. Correct. I, I, I don't work with them directly, so I can't say exactly what's in uh, the entire agreement, but. Okay. And a dovetail on that question, is it also, um, is it, have to be a designated as affordable by um, Denise Thomas's group. I, I don't remember the designation, the affordable the housing folks. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Bill Clegg. I'm the county attorney. Good morning. Uh, we work with these very, very often. And ALURA, or Land Use Restriction Agreement, is a contract that is recorded in the official records like a deed restriction, like a deck that you see on a subdivision so that it runs with the land. The terms vary depending upon the period of affordability, the type of housing, the location of the housing, and those are typically negotiated through the REO department and brought to the board for approval. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Ms. Knapp? Nope. Very good, all right, thank you. All right, uh, I don't have any speaker cards, but I'm gonna open this up to anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application. Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward. Do we have any callers? No callers? All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, close the um, public comment portion of the hearing and ask if there's any additional questions, clarification needed. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna close the public hearing on this item. Um, uh, discussion or the chair will consider a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Ordinance 2119, amending the Manti County Land Development Code as, am as amended as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second, Mr. Smock. Any discussion? All right. Chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Okay, hearing none. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, did you uh, vote in the affirmative? Yes, sir, I did. Very good, thank you. Uh, chair votes aye, motion passes 6-0. Thank you. All right, next item, item number six. And just for the interest of uh, planning, um, we're gonna try to get through the, the next two items around 12.30. If it looks like we're not gonna hit the 12.30, I'm gonna call for uh, lunch. So is that okay with the commissioners? Let's go. Okay. I do have to leave uh, by 12.45. Okay, all right, thank you. Let's do this. All right, uh, next item is uh, item number six. Again, it's a um, quasi-judicial, which means we're back to being sworn in. So, Ms. Slider, can you please read item number six into the record? Item number six, C2102, RT Palm Company Owner, PLN 2102-0088. is a reason of more or less three acres in the north side of State Road 64 is approximately 1,300 feet east of Lorraine Road, Brennington, Manatee County from A, General Agriculture to General Commercial Zoning District. The uh, a judicial case. The case manager is Ms., uh, Mr. Kevin Oldman, and he represented the applicant is Mr. Smith. Very good. 
Again. Thank you, Rosina, for the name. Again, my name is Bob Schmidt with Land Planning Associates, and I have been sworn. Mr. Schmidt, can you hold uh, any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. No, no. Very good. Thank you. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, this is a rezone request for Ar Arctic Palm Nursery. This is located on State Road 64, about 1,300 feet east of Lorraine Road. Um, I'll start by showing you the aerial from the staff report, and you can see Lorraine here to the west. And there's the site. It's three acres in size, which is non-conforming for its current zoning. The current zoning is agricultural, and you're supposed to have five. Uh, the staff report identifies that as being legal non-conforming. So it's not as though we are taking away the use, but the change in the zoning would allow the, um, it would make it conforming to the GC zoning district. This is what the site looks like today in the blow-up of the aerial. It is a nursery. It's an active nursery by uh, Mike Armstrong Landscaping. And uh, he has a lease on the property with the owner, Gary Taylor, who is also in the nursery business. And uh, there is no imminent plan to change the use of the property. Uh, as I said, it is a, I believe it's an active lease. And uh, uh, the purpose of Mr. Taylor's rezone really is to set him, him and his family up for the future knowing that it, it um, uh, meets commercial locational criteria and qualifies for commercial zoning would certainly maximize the, um, the future use of the land. Um, again, it is located on State Road 64, which is a thoroughfare in the urban surface, service area. The staff report identifies, um, the, they, and, and we did discuss this prior to the application being submitted, they felt a little bit more comfortable with NC here, neighborhood commercial, as opposed to GC. And I wanted to talk about that because um, what you see on the zoning map there are a couple of rezones that were recently done, both to GC. And there's a seven-acre gap in between the GC to the west and my client's property here. Uh, the uses are similar in GC and NC, but there has been some um, expression of, uh, I think there's a future pre-application uh, in this area for a comp plan amendment to do some multifamily. GC would allow multifamily, not that there's any plan to do so, but if somebody were to combine those pieces in the north, then they can ask for that. NC would not allow that. So in discussing that with my client, he said, I, I'm, I prefer GC to be out there in the future with seven acres of future GC to the west of me will hinder my development for uh, and limit it to neighborhood commercial only, and he, he didn't want to do that. So that's uh, the that's discussion there. Uh, I did read the staff report, and I concur with its findings, with the exception of the uh, NC zoning uh, item that I just mentioned. And uh, with that, I'll close. We, I'd like to get your approval for recommendation of approval to, to take to the board. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very good. Any questions for the applicant? Yes, yeah. sir. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Schmidt. thank you. All right. We'll go to Mr. Oatman's uh, presentation. Good morning, my name is Kevin Oatman and I've been sworn in. I'm with uh, Building and Development Services. <clears throat> Project Z21-02 is the Arctic Palm Company rezone. The subject property is located north side of State Road 64 East, about 1,300 square, uh, excuse me, 1,300 feet east of Lorraine Road, as Mr. Schmidt had said to you before. The request is to rezone a three acre parcel from general agricultural to general commercial GC. The property is located between two general agricultural zone properties. Staff did, as Mr. Spitt had said, staff explained to them and recommended that the neighborhood commercial medium zoning district could be more appropriate for the subject site because of the higher intensity uses allowed in GC could be a concern for those impacted door to the north of the residential community. Per the, LCD, uh, per the Land Development Code, LDC, the three-acre parcel should be five acres or to be buildable, but at the present time, it is considered legally a non-conforming lot. The applicant is requested to, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Ah, the site is one parcel, approximately three acres. 
to the north of it is the residential um, zoning, planned development residential zoning. To the south is general, general agricultural A with planned development PDC and GC commercial. To the east of the property is general A commercial zoning. While to the west, as Mr. Schmidt had said, that there's general A commercial, as well as general commercial medium and planned development commercial and GC. The future land use for this parcel is Urban Fringe 3. Um, surrounding it and the area around it is also within that same future land use category. The gro maximum gross residential density is three dwellings per acre, with nine dwellings per acre, um, acre because of it being in the activity nodes. The maximum floor ratio at this time would be 0.5, which gives the maximum building square footage of 65,340 because it is within the commercial activity node. In comparison from what we had recommended for the NC uh, neighborhood commercial medium versus the general commercial, in NC um, neighborhood commercial, it's only limited to 30,000 square feet. And if it is multifamily or commercial, the maximum height would be three stories. Whereas with general commercial, that would um, allow up to 65,340 square feet in the UF3 future land use because again, it's at the activity node. If it's multifamily commercial, the height would be able to go to the maximum of four stories. Can be to six stories if there was a special permit. In comparison for the land use, there are a couple of items that um, neighborhood commercial would not allow where GC would allow, and that would be a car wash, equipment sales, rental, as well as heavy vehicle repair. Now, there are some um, higher intense uses that would be allowed in both, which is gas pumps, uh, service stations, as well as vehicle repair and warehouse. Those would require a special permit if it is allowed in the NCM zoning, whereas in GC, it would just be administrative, right? The positive aspects of this is the rezone is a logical expansion of the commercial along State Road 64 East. The site has direct access to a major arterial and is the area is designated for mixed uses. However, for the negative aspects, because of the, some of the uses within this commercial area, it could have potential for um, lighting and impact, noise impacts to the residents to the north. The Land Development Code provides standards for specific uses that may have negative extremities and has requirements for additional landscape and buffering for certain commercial uses next to the residential uses. They will be administratively reviewed at the time of the submittal for the final site plan. This request does appear to be consistent with both the comprehensive plan and the LDC. Thank you. Have a good day. Very good. Uh, Mr. Oatman, I have a real quick question. Is there were there mitigating circumstances related to the um, parcel to the south and the parcel to the west that received um, uh, GC zoning designations different than this parcel? We so can speak on the uh, uh, GC the to the west. The parcel that was rezoned to MCM was rezoned with the, uh, with the adoption of the Land Development Code, and GC was approved in 2018. And it's a rezone. With rezone, we cannot post it any uh, stipulations, you know. My, my question is more, was there a consideration, like, for example, it's uh, – in close proximity to Lorraine Road or closer proximity, so therefore it's... Yes, uh, this was a more established node, you know, mm -hmm. close to the intersection. In this case, part of the complaints that or concerns that we have is, first, the um, side of the... The side, no, the configuration of the side that is a long side. Right, right. And in order to um, develop a project you know, with maybe four stories, going to be some constraints that can affect the uh, view from the adjacent neighbors. We are recommended more that MCM because we were thinking that we're more suitable for mitigate any potential impacts. But both the MCA and the GC are in the 
range of potential uses and are consistent with the comprehensive plan. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing and um, just so open it up for discussion. Um, my thoughts are, you know, relative to the discussion we had previously about planning, this is on an arterial road. So I understand the concern related to the, the neighboring, um, uh, the, the neighborhood uh, to the north, um, I, I think, in, NC would be more appropriate if it were within the community. The fact that it's along an arterial, I, I think is uh, counter or counters the argument or the concern weighs against the concern. So it seems appropriate. I, I understand the concern. I wouldn't want a four story building next to my home, but this also generally speaking, I think the intent or the desire is to push the businesses close to the roadway and utilize the rear for, say, stormwater or something like that. And again, there is the possibility of aggregation of other parcels. So that's, that's just my thought. I know I, I, I understand and respect staff's opinion. I just think the, um, it, it would be a disservice on this parcel to uh, um, try to mitigate concerns that have not yet been been brought forward, but I mean, I, it could very well be, but I think it, it's, you know, we just have to weigh the um, benefits versus the impacts. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend adoption of the County Zoning Ordinance Z2102. All right. Uh, before we do that, let's have um, some uh, rebuttal, if. Oh. <laughs> I thought we were down to that point. <laughs> but, uh, before, before we rebut. Anxious. <laughs> staff closing comments? express that is more for compatibility to the adjacent neighbors. Right, thank you. And I, the hard part is the compatibility of State Road 64 right there. That's, <laughs> I'm sure that's uh, noisy. So, um, so uh, Mr. Schmidt, oh, I, rebuttal? I just want to, yeah, uh, I really don't have a rebuttal. Just your point of the value of the property is towards the front. And the, we, we presume that whoever comes along and develops it will put the stormwater in the rear. And yeah. It's, it's visibility that's so important on a that thoroughfare road. Very good. Thank you. All right. Mr. DeLesline. I recommend an adoption of Manatee County Zoning Ordinance Z2102. Very good. We have, a, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Ron, second. Any discussion? All right. Hearing none, I'm going to call the matter to the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. So, all right, we're up to item number seven. Again, this is a quasi-judicial um, item, so you must be sworn to provide testimony or make yep. comment. So, um, Ms. Ms. Slider, can you read item PDMU 2032, paren G, into the record? Yes, pretty. item number seven, PDMU 2032, CG. Jones Farms, Jones Potato Farm, Farms, INC owner, First City Property Company, LLC, contra purchases. It's a quasi-judicial case, a reason yep. of more or less 635 acres from AMCO, General Agriculture, North Central Overlay District, to the PDMU NCO Plan Development Mixed Use. Sunning District retaining the North Central Overlay District. The site is generally located north of Bukai Road and west of Pritchard Road, Parish, Manatee County, approving a general development plan, large project application for 1,833 residential units, single family detached, single family semi detached, single family attached, and multi family and 300,000 square feet of commercial space. This is a quasi-judicial. The case manager is Mr. Marshall Robinson, and he represented the applicant as Mr. Alan Jones, Mr. Caleb Grimes, and Ms. Rachel Layton. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I need to swear some more people in. Okay. All right. Um, 
If you intend to speak on this application, this is the last application we have. So if you intend to speak, please rise to be sworn in. If you haven't already. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate? I do. Very good. Thank you. All right, uh, commissioners, any ex parte communications regarding this application? Yes, sir. No. No, sir. Mr. Rutledge? No, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, uh, if you would, Mr. Jones, please introduce your application. Uh, great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Alan Jones. I'm the owner of Jones Potato Farm. Um, we've operated this uh, property as a farm for the last uh, 20 years as a commercial farm. Um, this parcel is in the urban service boundary and uh, properties to the east, west, and south have all been approved for planned developments. Um, our general development proposal follows the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan and will be used to plan the Fort Hamer extension, which is on the county thoroughfare plan. I've put together the best people, planners, and uh, developers I can to bring a presentation that I hope you'll enjoy today. So thank you for your time. and. We'll see what happens. Thank you. <laughs> morning, Good morning, Grimes. Commissioners. Uh, I am Caleb Grimes with the law firm of Grimes Galvano, and I have been sworn uh, earlier this morning. Uh, you know, I, I really am pleased to be here on behalf of Alan Jones and his development team for this site that you'll hear from in just a moment. Uh, what I want to do is introduce to you uh, who we'll have here today and who we'll hear from on this uh, project, which is, uh, as Alan in indicated, is a project consistent with what we have going on in North County. Uh, the timing is appropriate and uh, one that I think you will appreciate. With us today, first we have Mr. Pat Neal, who really needs no introduction, I think everyone knows him, and John Neal, uh, both of whom you will hear from uh, later. They are leading the development of, of this uh, project. Our engineer, engineering and planning company is ZNS Engineering. And with us today, we have Mr. Jeb Mulock, our uh, engineer for the project, who has done a lot of engineering in this area, and Rachel Layton, uh, planner with ZNS, and you will hear from uh, Rachel right after me, and she'll tell you a lot more about this project. We also have uh, environmental uh, covered by Joel Christian with Ardura. And our transportation traffic, we have Mr. Jay Calhoun of Vibe. <coughs> what you have here today is a request for a rezone from agriculture to plan development mixed use. And it is one that has gone through large project review because of its uh, size and nature. And as you know, large project, project review means an extensive review of all aspects by your county and with a lot of uh, information provided to the county so that it can properly be reviewed. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Rachel Layton, who will tell you more about the project. Rachel. Morning. Good morning. My name is Rachel Layton. I am a certified planner, um, just having celebrated my 20th year in the AICP. Um, I have been with uh, ZNS Engineering now for about eight years, but I've been working in this community since 1998, um, and I'm pleased to be a part of the continuing growth in our county um, with these projects. Um, we worked on IA Manatee to the south. And I have been sworn. Sorry, I was sworn twice this morning, just to make sure everybody saw me that second time. Um, with the location of this project just to the south of Hillsborough County and abutting the Hillsborough County line, I wanted to go ahead and advertise to those folks that were in Hillsborough County, the property owners that are 500 feet to the north of us. So you'll hear from some of them today. The property is located on 100, uh, sorry, 635 acres of land on the north side of Buckeye Road, south of the Hillsborough County line and approximately one mile west of US 301 and Parish. Fort Hamer Road extension will bisect the property, as will the alignment of JJ Road. Uh, 
The property is actively used for agricultural purposes today. There are 69.98 acres of wetlands on the property. We propose to preserve all of them. The parcel is suitable for development. The general development plan proposes 1,833 residential lots for a maximum gross density of three units per acre. And this is, uh, we took out the 24 acres of commercial to, to utilize this calculation. We are proposing a, a maximum of 300,000 square feet of commercial development, and that's a floor area ratio of 0.29, and these items are consistent with the comprehensive plan. Fort Hamer Road will be extended north from Buckeye Road as part of this project. There will be multiple access points along Buckeye Road and Fort Hamer Road and JJ Road. We wanted to have as much connectivity through this project as possible. Project design proposes three commercial parcels at the activity nodes, two at Buckeye Road and Fort Hamer Road, and one at the southwest corner of Fort Hamer Road and JJ Road. The project design also includes a potential park site with 15 acres that you can see at the southeast corner of JJ Road and Fort Hamer Road, and then a school site adjacent to that for 20 acres. And we've been in communication with both the Parks and Recreation Department and the school board for these properties. Um, the general development plan design includes open space consistent with land development regulations. Um, at this level, we're providing 32% open space where 25% is required. 20% open space will be required for the commercial parcels. Project includes 30-foot thoroughfare buffers along Buckeye Road, Fort Hamer Road, and JJ Road for the residential parcels, and 25-foot thoroughfare buffers for the commercial parcels. We are providing 20-foot buffers along the north, east, and west boundaries of the project. Project design does include future right-of-way setback along Buckeye Road. Fort Hamer Road extension and JJ Road extension are on the thoroughfare maps that you were presented earlier this morning um, and are included in the gen general development plan for right-of-way reservation. With this project, we did a traffic impact statement instead of seeking concurrency. So that way, as the project develops, the staff will have an opportunity to review in detail the traffic operations and the traffic studies um, consistent with this plan. Our amenity centers will be sized and phased in conjunction with each residential phase of development to meet the recreational <coughs> needs of the residents. The amenity centers may include clubhouses, pools, and other outdoor facilities. We are proposing um, residential detached, semi-detached, attached, and multifamily. And with that, multifamily and non-residential buildings will be limited to height in three stories. Single family, detached, semi-detached, and attached will be limited in height to two stories. The design of the project is consistent with land development code regulations, compatible with projects in the area, and compliant with the comprehensive plan. The area along Buckeye Road and Moccasin Wallow Road moving from west along US 301, uh, sorry, along Buckeye Road and Moccasin Wallow to 301 is transitioning from agricultural uses to plan development. We have the villages of Amazon South along Moccasin Wallow. We have Havel Farms to, to the north of them, and this creates North River Ranch. We have IA Manatee um, to the north of that project. So we have this, this large area of several thousand acres um, of plan development mixed use immediately to our south. And as Mr. Jones mentioned, there are approvals for the projects that are along either side of this, this property. Nearby approvals along I-75 also include Sawgrass Gateway, Buckhead Trails, and Eagle Point. The property is within the UF3 future land use category, which allows residential and support uses with a maximum gross density of three dwelling units per acre, a maximum floor area of 0.35, which increases to 0.5 at activity nodes. The comprehensive plan limits the non-residential development to 300,000 square feet in UF3. And you can see really this area of the county is UF3, and we are west of the future development area boundary. The property is currently zoned general agricultural in the North Central Overlay District. The proposed zoning will amend the map to plan development mixed use PDR and PDMU zoning have been approved in this area, and residential developments are in the North River Ranch are now selling. These approvals are changing the character of the area from agricultural to residential development pattern, consistent with the comprehensive plan. Plan development mixed use district is intended for the establishment of complementary groupings of residential and commercial uses. We have several specific approval requests with this application, four of them are in the North Central Overlay District that you see on a regular basis for um, the buffers to be reduced, 
um, both for uh, residential uses on thoroughfares, commercial thoroughfares, and the pool cages adjacent to buffers, um, as well as asking for a retail building over 75,000 square feet. And these have been granted numerous times. Um, I'd like to point out two of the other um, specific approvals. Um, one is to allow sidewalks on one side of the street within two miles of public school with design to be reviewed with the school district. They are in support of that one. And staff is not in support of this other one where we proposed a maximum length of cul-de-sacs from 800 feet to 1,300 feet with a turnaround at 660 feet. We did present this graphic as part of the specific approval and offered a stipulation. Um, so where a specific approval is not granted, final site plan will comply with all land development code regulations, including stormwater design, lighting, landscaping, building setbacks, and open space. And our application has received a supportive staff report. And now I'd like to bring up John Neal. Hello, Commissioners. John Neal, Neal Land and Neighborhoods. Uh, I've been sworn in for today's presentation. I think, I think Rachel did a, a great job, so I, I get to talk about the fun stuff. All right, so uh, <clears throat> my team has a good track record of uh, building uh, multimodal and connection. I heard Mr. Rutledge talking about it earlier, so I, it's uh, fortuitous that I get to talk about it now. Uh, uh, part of our development in uh, North River Ranch to the south has instituted uh, some of these um, things that you see on the uh, screen now. This is include walking trails, wide paved services for pedestrians, bike trails, roadside bike paths, boardwalks, and even fairweather access to uh, conserved lands. Um, these elements are, as I said, a hallmark of our development, and so it's something we plan to bring forward here to uh, Jones Farm. I make a point to mention this whenever I'm in uh, the company of commissioners or anybody actually who will listen. I've been talking to the newspaper about it because it's my hope that uh, this part of uh, North County will use these as examples to develop standards uh, whereby we can get people out of cars and into, uh, uh, into other modes of trans uh, transportation by uh, providing commercial nearby for them to do their shopping and, and whatnot uh, and also uh, to access schools. <clears throat> That's that's part of the, uh, excuse me, there we go. <clears throat> so uh, Neil Landon Neighborhoods is a master planning organization and development organization. Uh, we think outside of the subdivision and think uh, about the larger community. So what you see here is a road. We've been talking about roads all morning. And for the last few years, uh, Pat and I have been working on the extension of Fort Hamer Road, which he'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute. We've heard citizens ask for years, I'm sure that you've heard citizens ask for years, that uh, new development and, and growth have infrastructure planned and in place for new homes in advance. I want to tell you it's not easy, but we've heard, and it's something that we've been working on, and uh, here in the Jones Farm property, we'll bring uh, Fort Hamer Road right through the middle. One of the benefits of having this arterial road is that it creates an artery in this area of the county, especially for the... the um, connections to schools. I think in the next presentation, instead of just a plain old road, we'll have a bunch of uh, schools there because in the last few years we've created the uh, p uh, Parish Community High School at the south end of North River Ranch, a new elementary school, a future State College of Florida, a middle school just to the south, and here on this property, as you'll see, a new park and a, a proposed elementary school. Uh, we uh, we like the arterial road, Mr. Mr. Connolly, because as you, as you discussed earlier, it keeps, uh, keeps our traffic, keeps new traffic off of the uh, local roads, let, lets them remain local and uh, collect onto this road and it'll get people out to the interstate. Again, it's our goal by providing this forward-looking leadership that we can encourage other developers and landowners in the area to think ahead for the needs of their future developments and provide roads and facilities necessary to help provide bright, healthy and safe traffic movement for future residents in this area. In closing for my part of the presentation, I'd like to take just another couple seconds to show the 3.5 mile radius of this area. Red is active development as Rachel identified in her presentation. Blue is in permitting now. And what you could see is that Jones Farm on the top in blue is the log uh, logical continuation of this progress. I'm uh, being served by Fort, Fort Hamer, which is also in red. It's a little hard for me to see that, but I think, uh, I think it's, 
enforced. Uh, this will uh, this will be a great project. I'd appreciate your support uh, and support for our, our special requests. Uh, and uh, here's Pat Neal discuss more about uh, Fort Hamer Road. Chairman, I'm Pat Neal, 1003 59th Street Northwest, and I have been sworn. My families have built about 18,000 homes in Manatee County over the last 51 years. We have become much more interested in building high-value housing with good transportation facilities, more parks, more facilities. We've been working hard on schools, and I believe that you will find much like Lakewood Ranch has blossomed to be more than we ever thought it would be, the North River Ranch and the 5,800 homes that John is building next door will be an exciting place for Manatee County, as well as the Arbor Park property, which is to the east, which is also partly under our ownership. We think that the future of Manatee County will be to create a more modern, more exciting place for people to live, people who currently live in Bradenton, but in this location, people who live in Pinellas County and Manatee County. Could I have just only five more minutes? <laughs> yes, as long as you're not filibustering. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, that's a problem with me, Mr. Chairman, so here I go. Of course, the Fort Hamer extension is 26 miles long. It will be the only unbroken 26-mile road through Manatee County. Uh, it's very important as a reliever of I-75, which also functions as a local road. We think about 57% of the traffic in the mornings on I-75 functions as local road. And the reason for the regional support for the Fort Hamer extension and exit 234 is it relieves 12% of the total trips on I-75. Here's a picture, if I can do it with Elmo, of exit 234, which is coming uh, in South Hillsborough County. This, of course, shows a dead-end road. You've actually approved a dead-end road this morning, but of course it has to go through Hillsborough County as well. Primarily for the education of, the, of your team in connection with this plan, we want to make sure that you see that Fort Hamer goes somewhere. It goes to 234 uh, and then to US 41 just south of uh, Sun City Center, actually south of Ruskin. I think I'll close by saying we thought through the region. We think this is a well-planned development. We've heard little opposition you will hear from four families from Hillsborough County in the Sun Sundance subdivision, and I would like to hear them and then respond to their comments. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the extra three and a half minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay. Very good. All right. Who do we have for staff? Oh, Mr. Robinson. So you have your running shoes on. That makes a statement. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Marshall Robinson. I'm a staff planner with Development Services, and I have been sworn. Subject property is located east of I-75 and west of US-301 at the northwest corner of Buckeye Road and Pritchard Road in Parrish, and is also west of the Urban Service boundary. Subject property consists of approximately 635 acres. The future land use for the property is UF3, where the max density is allowed at three dwelling units per acre and gross and nine dwelling units per acre uh, for affordable housing and or mixed use projects at activity nodes. The max FAR allowed in the UF3 future land use is 0.35 and 0.5 at the activity node. Subject property is currently zoned general agriculture and is within the North Central Overlay District. The applicant's request is to rezone the subject property from general agricultural and NCO to PDMU plan development mixed use and NCO for the approval of a general development plan to allow 1,833 residential units consistent of single family detached, single family semi detached, single family attached and multifamily. Also is 300,000 square feet of non-residential uses in accordance with the schedule of permitted and prohibited uses proffered by the applicant. 
The applicant uh, spoke about the specific approval request. Mm. Here they are in the presentation. Uh, Rachel spoke to the specificity of each of the requests. I will make a note uh, for the uh, increased maximum length for cul-de-sacs. Um, just want to touch on that before we get to the site plan. Um, you know, normally when, when those specific approval requests come in for uh, extensions to the maximum length for cul-de-sacs, uh, we usually get some detailed information on the location of this cul-de-sacs and whether or not there's any implication for environmentally sensitive lands being impacted. Usually there's, there's some stuff, something in the justification statement and something detailed on the plan that gives us some context for why the uh, extra length for the cul-de-sac is needed. And um, Tom Gerstenberger's here and some of the other folks from staff, so we might be able to speak on that if there are any more questions about uh, the specific approval request for the extended length. The proposed GDP is a large project application, and it consists of 635 acres. And the yellow here is the location for the proposed 1,833 residential units on approximately 611 acres. The red is the location of the proposed maximum 300,000 square feet of non-residential uses proffered by the applicant. And there's a future park here in green shown on a 15-acre site. There's also a 20-acre site for a school or future residential development. And there are 20-foot greenbelt buffers provided throughout the site, specifically along the west, north, and east boundaries, and internal to the development providing buffering for residential uses adjacent to non-residential uses. Here we can see the 30-foot roadway buffers for residential uses adjacent to the thoroughfares. And here we can see the 25-foot roadway buffers for commercial projects adjacent to the thoroughfares. Uh, it should be noted that the future thoroughfares in Fort Hamer Road and JJ Road, these roadways, want, are, these roadways, once constructed, will qualify the intersections as activity nodes, allowing development within activity nodes uh, for a maximum FAR of 0.5 until 300,000 square feet of non-residential uses is achieved, achieved for the overall project. The intersection of Fort Hamer Road and Buckeye Road will also qualify as an activity road once Fort Hamer Road is constructed. The request to increase the maximum cul-de-sac length for the project is not supported by staff. I already told you that, didn't I? <clears throat> and the typical uh, lot layouts are here. These are pretty consistent with the other plan developments that uh, have been approved previously in the area in the vicinity. Nothing new, I think, with these development standards. And the positive aspects and negative aspects and mitigation me measures were provided in your staff report. And after a look at those, I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Very good. Uh, just, uh, I think you've probably inferred it, but just a clear statement. The only point of contention is cul-de-sac length? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, any questions for staff? We'll touch on that after. <laughs> mm. um, all right. I'm going to go ahead. I've, I've got several speaker cards here, so I'm going to call the cards that I have. And if you would, come forward, state your name, and uh, please uh, let us know your concerns. The first speaker card I have is Ralph Greeley. And uh, if I failed to say it, um, state your name and that you have been sworn. Again, this is uh, quasi-judicial. So Mr. Mr. Greeley, if you would, come forward. And after Mr. Greeley, we'll have Mr. Robert Moon. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Ralph Greenlee, and I've been a resident of the community of Sundance for 41 years. And, and that you have been sworn, I'm sorry. And have been sworn. <laughs> I know it's have, have repeated over year. and over. Yes. So. <laughs> I'm here this, mor this afternoon to discuss PDMU 2023 Jones Farm application. My community recommends denial of the aforementioned plan development. The community of Sundance does think highly of Manatee County and as such spends time, dollars, patronizing your restaurant, stores, venue. I wonder if that came from the relationship of your ex-administrator Ed Hunsinger and our ex-administrator Mike Merrill. They had meetings, they talked out common challenges. I do know that no such recent meetings between counties 
or between active community and active rezoning application ever took place and could have been based on your future land use documentation. Commissioners, our community would certainly like to hear from Manatee County on their plans for both mitigation of urban sprawl and immediate plans for resolution for sustainable transportation planning. Your county commissioners already have approved over 12,000 home sites in the last few years in the, I'll call it, parish plush area. What data presented itself that warrants the need for an additional 1,800 plus dwelling units now? Based upon proximity to Hillsborough County, I have more concerns. The section of 301 south of 674 to Moccasin Wallow is one lane north and one lane south. Two are needed for safety. This 1,800 plus additional home sites will also strain the section of 301 even more than it does now, no doubt costing more lives in fatal accidents. Just a couple of weeks ago, two more citizens died on Route 301. Folks, let's look at one of the applications. Page 14 of 34, PDMU, Jones. Item 7, light industrial uses are limited to microbreweries only. Really? Microbreweries typically distribute through a wholesaler, meaning for the collective us, yet more traffic coming out on 301. Great news for the traffic people. To increase traffic and also um, semi-noxious odors pervading the atmosphere. Commissioners, please vote for denial based on these cogent facts and the kind of staff report evidence and presented made public hearing finding the request to be inconsistent with the Manatee Comp Plan and the Manatee LDC. Attendees, attendees in the audience, if you agree with recommending denial, please stand. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you for all your time this afternoon. Bless you all and safe travels. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moon, if you would, and after Mr. Moon, uh, Yvonne Grizel. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Bob Moon, and I have been sworn. I have been a resident of the Sons of Ants community for 28 years. Uh, I'm here today, or this morning, to again dis discuss the Jones P PLE 2012-56 uh, application. Our board of directors and the community have asked for deni ask us to recommend denial for this uh, plan development. Commissioners, it is interesting that the uh, ZNS Engineering sent a packet out of information <clears throat> in the mail on August 26 about the aforesaid application. Adjacent property owners, which are our homeowners who are directly affected by the most uh, vulnerable receiving the letter on August the 28th. We, of course, uh, knew that there was much more detail that we needed to get, so we pursued briskly. Nothing like having nine days to put together a response uh, for something this important. I wanted to see if you knew that page 23, the final Jones staff report PDF, your applicant made no mention of the community of Sundance until today we got here. Uh, the title of this page was uh, G period relationships with adjacent property owners. This on the surface was grossly inept answer with less than 500 feet away from the said uh, planned development you can see on via the map for the four roads of the adjacent properties and these are our roads. That's Circle L Place in Sundance, Long Rifle Drive, the extension of Lightfoot Road, and Butch Cassidy Trail. Commissioners, maybe the development should have used note 31 for general development plan 07.29.21 PDF to install walls to protect the residents from living on these roads mentioned um, pri previously. By the way, page 11, in, uh, endangered species, the applicant said no mention uh, of species were observed during the preliminary wildlife and habitat assessment conducted uh, in the site on October 2020. Um, basically, I can say, we're rural and you got to be kidding me. 200 feet of Tico easement. Uh, this is a rural area, and we've seen everything uh, in wildlife in this um, community except for the Florida black bear. And I repeat, 
everything, and you can uh, add what you want to that. Uh, page 13 speaks of the negative aspects of the plan. There's no current water or wastewater facility bordering the development project. Let me add, currently there is a pump generator for pumping water running most of the time, and we can hear it in Sundance. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, potato farm is adjacent to the southernmost properties of Sundance. No noise abatement is, uh, noise, noise abatement is needed as uh, well as security for this plan to go forward. Please vote for denial because of the fact-based scenario based upon the staff reports, evidence presented, comments made by public hearings, findings of the request to be inconsistent uh, with the Manatee County Comp Plan and LDC. And again, I'll ask if all attendees here that uh, recommend denial, please stand. We're not gonna do that. Sure. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. Next time somebody stands up, we're gonna take a recess, 10 minute recess. Understand, very good. Thank Th you very thank much you. for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, next uh, speaker card I have is Yvonne Grizel, and then after uh, Yvonne Grizel, Lewis Barnes. My name is Yvonne Grizel, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I have been a um, resident of Manatee County for over uh, 20 years, and I recently moved into the neighborhood of Sundance. Um, I'm asking for three, uh, for you to deny on three accounts. One is the zoning change. You are now asking us to change a rural area into a um, urban area. The houses here are going to be five feet apart. The roads, we heard earlier, nine billion dollars to run these roads. You are in, a, you don't even have them. This same developer developed along Moccasin Wallow Road. Moccasin Wallow Road is still only two lanes. Where is the infrastructure for this development going to come from? You're going to put 1,833 homes in an area, and I would like to ask each one of you to take a drive, please, down Buckeye Road and see what it looks like today, and then add 3,000 cars on that road because Fort Hammer is not coming anytime soon, and neither is JJ Road. So why are we going to put in 1,833 homes in an area that's agriculture? agriculture? Their environmental narrative shows a water the water drainage moving to the north into Little Manatee River, right through Sundance. Do you know what they used? The FEMA map from 2014, not the one that just came out. Not the one that was, came out in 2019, but 2014. The houses in Sundance already are taking the drainage from the fields. What's going to happen when they're paved over and the water runoff runs right through Sundance to get to the Man Little Manatee River? Sorry, not Manatee River. Commissioners, please hear us. 1,833 additional homes. They haven't, <coughs> you don't have the, uh, the infrastructure yet for the houses that you've already put in Parish on Moccasin Walla Road. I'm asking for a denial because you don't have the infrastructure. You don't have the funding. How can you approve something that you have no money for? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Again, uh, Lewis Barnes, and after Lewis Barnes, we have Kimberly Camacho. Yes, I'm Lewis Barnes, and I'm sworn in, and thanks Thank once again for having me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my concerns, again, um, you know, we moved out <coughs> of the city a long time ago to get away from all the lights and the traffic and all that, and now... It seems like it's not just a little development. It's just like a city. Um, it's the way things are going. I get it. But I would like to ask that we look at how much light pollution we're going to generate. And also, once again, like everybody else already mentioned, 
any issues with traffic. My drive to where I work, Sarasota by the airport. My drive in the last few years has gone from 40 minutes one way to an hour and 15. When this goes in, I'm sure I'm going to be driving two hours one way to go to work. That's four hours a day on the road. So please take that all into consideration, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Again, uh, Kimber Kimberly Camacho, and after uh, Kimberly, we have Byron Hodg Hodgson. Hello, Commissioners. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. My name is Kimberly Camacho. I have been sworn. Thank you. I have a question. When is enough enough? We've already got all of these houses coming in that have already been approved, and we can't do anything about it. I'm asking you to vote against this today because, as they have said, environmentally, we have seen everything. In fact, um, approximately a month ago, I saw a uh, Florida Panther that crossed my path on Buckeye Road. Um, we see hawks, eagles, um, otter, um, <coughs> hogs, etc. You name it, it's out there. Everything but, like you said, a black bear. Um, the environmental impact on this is not just going to be to the animals. It's to the air quality. When you're adding um, that many houses, you're going to be adding almost 3,666 cars to our roadways. That produces a lot of air pollution, noise pollution, the light pollution that this is going to cause. This gentleman has, um, has come out there, and he had um, telescopes that he's gotten some wonderful pictures from. We won't see that anymore. My kids, I've been out there for 20 years. When my kids came out there, we used to love to look up at the stars. We won't be able to see those with our grandchildren because there's going to be too much light pollution. There's too many people. It's too much. When is enough enough? We've got to at least wait till we've got the infrastructure to handle it. Like the lady before me said, we don't have the car, the, the infrastructure structure for the cars to even move as is. It won't take them that long to build these houses. It never does. The houses will be up before the roadways are fixed, before we have the storm water ability to handle all the water come running off because you're now going from pervious ground to impervious, where's it going to go? It's got to stop at some point. We need to put a hold. We've got lots of homes coming in. We've got lots of, you know, lots of people moving in. There's enough homes. So I'm asking you to vote against this for now. Maybe it's something that needs to be readdressed in the future, but we don't have the ability to deal with it right at this time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, last speaker card I have is Byron Hodgkin. And uh, ma'am, if you could just uh, state the name and that he has been sworn. Okay. Thank you. This is Byram Hodgson, and he has been sworn. Thank you. I'm a, a neighboring landowner that's being encroached upon. This, the map you showed on the screen shows that the Pritchard Road is owned by the development, and that, that way it locks me out from my 100 acres of land behind it. That's my entryway, and it's now a dedicated road. The other problem I am, I've had 25 years of taxes on a messed up deed that was concocted with non-recorded uh, measurements, and th they have come at me several times to steal my ditches that were dug in 1962 for my property, and they want to to get the drainage from uh, use in my my ditches, and uh, the uh, I pay the taxes. I got the tax report. 
this year. And they, 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 I, 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 uh, I, I don't, uh, it's, there's, they, they made mistakes in the drawing and they get made two triangles and then so they gerrymandered them. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anybody who didn't provide a speaker card who wishes to come and speak on this application? You have to come up and uh, again, just state your name and that you have been sworn. Seems like I've said that before. <coughs> Phil Moss, can you hear me? Yes. Phil Moss, I'm with the Sundance community and I have been sworn. Thank you. I just, um, you know, just to recap, and I promise I'll end before 1230, um, the, um, you know, I think we are at a breaking point. You know, what has, what is in flight in that area of the county? We don't really know the impact of it. Um, that Buckeye Road specifically, uh, just a few months ago, we had the Piney Point incident. Buckeye Road is, that's where Piney Point is. So you're talking about putting 1,800 homes on a road that is one lane, there's no emergency lanes. And when you, if you drive off that road, you it is gonna be, you're gonna be in a ditch that is 20 feet deep in a lot of areas. So I just would, uh, given the impact of where, I don't know what's happening, you know, with Piney Point, if there is another event and you have that many homes in that area, evacuation routes in and out of there, uh, I think it's too much too soon. And I would hope that the Manatee County Commissioners would reconsider or consider uh, den denying this for now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, again, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing. Um, I made a comment about approaching 1230. Um, what's the pleasure of the commission? Do you wanna power through? Staff is uh, mainly a clerk. clerk. Um, are we? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, let's uh, just go ahead and try to, try to um, work through this. Um, so we've had a, a lot of comments. I, I have a couple questions, um, Mr. Mr. Neal, or maybe somebody from the Neal team. Um, if you could, um, can you please give some additional information related to the um, uh, Fort Hamer Road? Um, as I recall, I think you've been involved in construction of a portion of that already, and is there, are there segments of the road that are currently um, approved and, and likely to be constructed separate and apart from the segments within this community that would provide access? Pat Neal, Mr. Chairman, the answers are yes, yes, and yes. You may recall that on May uh, 4th, 2008, the tanker truck blew up over the Manatee River. And Carlos Baruf and I came up with a $30 million plan to, uh, a tolling plan to build and uh, subsume the county's responsibilities for their $92 million bridge. We then created the Economic Stimulus Working Group, found a way to uh, mitigate the sawtooth swordfish, found a way to finance it, changed the price of the bridge to about $30 million, to about $30 million including the change orders, and finished that bridge. Um, it was awarded, we actually bid fifth once it was set up, we saw that somebody who was really a bridge builder could build it, and they, Johnson Construction Company did build it. You know that in your comprehensive plan and in your advanced plans, both the north and south approaches to uh, Fort Hamer Bridge, what's called Manatee, Upper Manatee River Road on the south, are in your plan for the next uh, 48 months for completion. They should be awarded within the next 18 months. North of that, we'll complete uh, within a year the Fort Hamer extension to Mox and Walla Road. This will be with public funds. We've worked with uh, Ms. Mrs. D'Augustino and others for 14 pieces of right-of-way. It took us five and a half years to get it underway, but the picture that John showed you is a real picture of a four-lane highway headed north. We'll then build through our own property, uh, the remaining to our new middle school at Road FF, and north of us, Lennar will build through their property to Buckeye. 
then as part of the Jones Farm, property before you today, we contemplate a public infrastructure district which will build to the Hillsborough County line. And our primary work right now is with the Suburban Land Reserve, which is a company owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to build through their property through Hillsborough County to US 41. They own all the right-of-way. Of course, they're willing to make the right-of-way available for public transportation and a public infrastructure district. So we believe this road will be built to the south for 26 miles and to the north for five and a half miles. Okay, thank you. That's, that's one of the points I wanted to understand is that along with this comes a roadway network. It's not just utilizing Buckeye to, to, to access um, the roadway network. I might say that Mox and Waller Road is also going to be awarded within the next, as soon as the right of way from Mr. Chin is acquired, and the Lennar Company has agreed to uh, invest $4.2 million on uh, Buckeye. So we think that the urban infrastructure will be there. We've worked on or contributed to four school sites, and the junior college uh, landed there. So we think it's going to be a complete urban environment in due course. And uh, Mr. Neal, before you step away, could you please address the issue or the um, status or uh, your understanding of Pritchett Road? Is that a public right of way? And is it is it the intent of the project to improve it? Uh, I'm glad I met Mr. Barnes and Mr. Hodgkin. I'm going to go see Mr. Hodgkin. We think he has every right of use and access. Mm -hmm. We don't contemplate that he'll have any struggles. I intend to talk with Caleb Grimes and Mr. Hodgkin right after this meeting to see if we can assuage his concerns. We see no concerns there. As to Mr. Barnes, we don't think we'll interrupt the current gravel road. We have, we'll use, in lighting cases, if there's lighting near him, it'll be star-saving light, lighting, but we have no desire to light his street or have any interaction with his street. It'll be separated by a buffer and most likely a hedge, perhaps also a berm. So we don't think we'll interfere either with their uses uh, on this project. And do you have a uh, information that would allow you to um, maybe explain how close the closest unit in the proposed community would be to the existing community just over the county line? Our property is separated from Sundance by a 320-foot Tico easement, so mm -hmm. under no circumstances will any house be closer than 320 feet. I might say, Mr. Chairman, for the correct facts, I know that our houses will be farther away than that, hmm. but I don't know the particular numbers. Okay. All right. Um, any additional questions for the applicant? Anything? Mr. Rutledge? You must have went no, to lunch. No, none, none, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. Um, so... Uh, Anything for staff? I mean, we've gone through the application, gone through public comments. Uh, I had to ask the questions I have. So um, is there anything further? I, I had one question for staff. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I, I really value the commitment by private enterprise to bring roadways and access uh, to our community because I live off the east side of 75. and access when 75 is blocked is is treacherous so i think there's a huge value there for us as a community not just the people directly by this property uh, but the other thing i wanted to know more specifically is uh mr neo if you could talk a little bit about how you see the integration of the commercial component and the multimodal kind of approach or the non-car traffic within the community because you take 600 people off the general highways because they can get groceries or gas or, you know, conveniences, uh, fast foods or some kind of sit-down restaurants. C can you talk a little bit about how you see that for this community? Because I do think that's a huge value if it's, in fact, schemed up. Uh, John Deal, for the record. Uh, Mr. Rutler, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address this. Uh, we, so we see the addition of uh, commercial as reducing trips off, off the road. Everybody needs to get uh, their dry cleaning. They need to get uh, groceries. They need to get uh, things nearby their house. So these are neighborhood neighborhood uses. And uh, commercial's different than it used to be. Uh, we have uh, Amazon now, so everybody shops while they're at work. And then when they get home, they have a, a box waiting on them. So they don't need kitchen stores and uh, places to buy Nikes and, and such. <clears throat> So we think that uh, 
entertainment is the bigger focus. It's uh, part of the reason for our special request uh, for um, a restaurants and a, uh, a brewery type, uh, uh, modern brewery type restaurant. We like the uh, multimodal. It's something that you can see today in the planning stages at North River Ranch just to the south. Uh, we think that it's a better adventure to go out with your honey on an electric bike or, a, uh, or just walk to go get a, a, a meal. It's part of the new urbanism uh, that you're seeing in communities all over the state, and uh, we've uh, done some research in, in all of those. So uh, um, I got a call from a homeowner the other day who, who indicated that he was happy that we had bike lanes because he has a bike lane, and uh, as Mr. Galliano stated, you know, the problem with our bike lanes in other parts of the counties is, is they don't go anywhere. So it's better to have a path or a sidewalk or a bike lane that takes you somewhere where you need to go. It makes them more useful. And that's part of our mission uh, to bring that to this area of the county. That's a, a larger uh, focus. And we do think we can get people out of uh, their vehicles and onto these uh, multi-use paths uh, to, to do the uh, things which they need to do. Actually, in uh, North River Ranch, maybe at the next meeting, I'll ride one of the bikes down. We have a bike share program. So if you're a resident in this community, you get a little app, and you can check out a bike, and you can take it anywhere you want, bring it back, park it in somewhere different, uh, and, uh, and it's been highly uh, used. We have good records. Does that address your uh, comments? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I, I, I agree with, the, the idea that we're not urban enough for some of this stuff, but I don't live in what I consider an urban part of the county, and I got bikes and runners and walkers and there's people all over the they want to be outside and i think with good design and i would argue you often do good design is that it's the right solution for what's going forward so yeah no listen that's helpful i think i think that's where we want to be going as a, com as a community oh, thank you thank you all right um i forgot to follow up on the cul-de-sac, the special exception related to the cul-de-sac. So is there somebody from staff that can maybe provide some clarification? Um, and then I'll ask the applicant related to that also. So you I, think, uh, I think Mr. Gerstenberger's, I think he, I think he was laid down on the floor to hide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, there he is. You can't hide, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first off, for the afternoon record, Thomas Gersenberger, Stormwater Engineering Division Manager, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, with respect to, Mr. Chair, with, with respect to uh, your question regarding the uh, specific approval for cul de sac mm. um, let me start off first with uh, what um, our county requirements for cul de sacs. Uh, within the LDC, county requirements for cul de sac length is a uh, maximum of 800 feet. Mm -hmm. um, with this particular application, um, there was some staffing reorganization that was done through Public Works. So what initially the applicant reached out to me to discuss as far as extending cul-de-sac lengths greater than 100, 800 feet was uh, transferred over to our new uh, development review uh, division. And then subsequently, that analysis, the final analysis and what you see as far as uh, that analysis that's included in the staff report was finalized by the development review staff. Uh, that being said, what my understanding is as far as the concern um, that was raised up in the staff report is essentially um, where these cul sacs that would be over 100 feet would be located within the overall development. With this being a general development plan, there is no uh, associated street layout. There is no engineering intent that identifies a uh, network of streets um, located within the overall development. Uh, that being said, tip and typical reasons why uh, coal sacks typically extend beyond 800 feet is for environmental concerns due to uh, well and traditional wetlands or drainage features uh, that would prevent uh, the local street network from being uh, interconnected, mm -hmm. from being connected or looped uh, internally within the street network system. So that all being said, um, the staff that um, had written up that particular portion of the specific approval findings, um, they are not present today, but certainly we, um, I will coordinate further with that staff and, and with the applicant regarding 
uh, the concerns that have been brought up in the staff report, and we will discuss this further um, at the B BCC land use hearing. Okay, uh, and you know, as an engineer, I've dealt with a lot of different municipalities, and I oftentimes experience multiple um, criteria where, like for this, uh, it, for example, the dead end uh, cul de sac mm -hmm. in Manatee, yes. it's 800, and in Sarasota, it's I think 1200, mm -hmm. Hillsborough might be 1500. NFPA has criteria, I think these Correct. are. Um, almost arbitrary. I, I think uh, I think you and I probably know the origin of this. I think it was two hose links was right the, uh, to string out two links yeah. of which from the fire. It's not fire. really arbitrary. There's a reason behind it, but there's also hydrants and uh, sufficient hydrants throughout a community that doesn't require more than two hose links typically. Well, and, and Mr. Chair, if I might add, and I'll go ahead and throw this exhibit on the exhibit that's included in the uh, staff report as well. The exhibit that's uh, included in the staff report and also included in the general development plan, um, you'll note that it, it that the specific approval request language identified in reference uh, 1,320 feet, which equates to or is equivalent to a quarter of a mile, mm -hmm. which based upon discussion with public safety staff, our public, our public safety department staff to, involved in, or our paramedics, excuse me, I'm trying to say, that is their um, standard requirements as far as reaction time for a section of uh, roadway that is severed or blocked. As mm -hmm. far as the reaction time essentially on foot, should there be a blockage or should that street be blocked, what is the reaction time um, to, a, to address a call at the end of that street on a quarter mile distance? So that, that's why as far as the philosophy for within contained within the specific approval for the quarter mile length. And then with that quarter mile length uh, is a provision for a mid block turnaround, which is identified with this eyebrow on this partic particular exhibit. Okay. All right. And uh, again, I, I think you, you made inferences to it, but it's not uncommon to get to seek relief related to the cul-de-sac, but the right. staff is the staff concern is that, um, there's no context Correct. Uh, associated with this request. Yes. I, th I think there would be an issue if Mr. Neal presented a plan that had every roadway as a, uh, as a 1320 cul-de-sac, cul and I'm sure that's not the case. I'm sure they can provide some additional information that helps the uh, uh, staff better understand the, the context for this question or this request. So, okay. Sir. All right, thank yes. you. Um, and if you don't mind, while I'm up, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I touch on the subject of storm water, storm water while I'm here? Sure, one of my favorite subjects. Oh, yes, mine as well. Could, could you not? <laughs> uh, yeah. I hear you in the background there, Paul. All right. All right, first off, um, you all right, Pat? Uh, sorry. Um, first off, uh, this particular, um, this is a, a sheet that comes straight out of the Journal Development Plan. It's a uh, uh, drainage uh, exhibit that we typically look for for a large project uh, application of this sort uh, to, to identify the existing and historic drainage patterns uh, with respect to the site and the surrounding areas. Um, first off, let me start off with, for this overall development, the overall development in its entirety is located within the Lower Manatee River watershed. And as we all know, um, staff, applicant, uh, the residents, uh, the public um, in, this, uh, in this hearing as well know, Lower Manatee River is, uh, Lower Manatee River watershed collects and drains water from both counties, from Manatee County and from Hillsborough County. Uh, the headwaters of the Low Manatee River are essentially out in the vicinity of Duet, and also leading further north into Hillsborough County beyond uh, Ruskin and Sun City Center. Uh, with respect to this particular uh, watershed, the Low Manatee River watershed, uh, Manatee County staff's best source of information for the Low Manatee County for the Low Manatee River watershed is Hillsborough County, because Hillsborough County. Um, has um, completed a watershed management plan for Little Manatee River. Uh, the watershed management plan includes uh, drainage runoff that uh, flows northward, in this particular case for this project, 
northwards into Hillsborough County. Um, as part of staff's review of this project, uh, we uh, requested that the applicant uh, and the uh, engineer of record for this uh, project uh, reach out to Hillsborough County to not only to obtain uh, information on the Lomanti River Watershed Management Plan, but also to um, collect and identify uh, the stormwater requirements and regulations that are associated with development in Hillsborough County. So what, and I'll bring this word. So what you see included in the staff report as are uh, and, and contained within in the uh, stormwater engineering conditions are essentially congregating, well, not congregating, excuse, excuse me, are essentially combining um, regulation, stormwater regulations from both Mantee County and Hillsborough County. So as far as attenuation requirements, as far as floodplain requirements, what you'll see as far as, um, and it's more specific to the first uh, stormwater condition number one is facets of Hillsborough and Manatee County design requirements in this uh, staff report as a stormwater condition. So as far as any type of stormwater design criteria, as far as storm events, as far as the uh, rainfall, um, and I know I'm getting very technical at this point, but essentially what we are used to and accustomed to in Manatee County, this applicant has taken it a step forward forward and it also accounted for design requirements that uh, would be associated with development in Hillsborough County. So um, as would be typical for Manatee County, we would look for attenuation for this, uh, for this particular project to design to account for stormwater runoff for a 25 year storm event uh, with respect to the attenuation of runoff in a post development condition and also to address uh, floodplain mitigation for impacts within uh, both the FEMA identified 100 year floodplain delineation, but also the Little Manatee River Watershed Management Plan identified 100 year floodplain delineation as well to that any impacts within those, uh, within those 100 year floodplain delineations be accounted for and addressed as part of the stormwater design for this project. Very good. So and uh, for the record, uh, Mr. Heap uh, departed at uh, 1249. Very good. Uh, Mr. Gersenberger, will county staff, Manatee County staff, coordinate with Hillsborough County staff regarding the results yes. of this model? So Sir. they'll provide them the yes. information. Okay. Sir. And uh, I notice in the condition or stipulation that um, it, there's a statement that um, that uh, the modeling shall demonstrate no adverse impacts. Um, I think typically we also associate that requirement go, um, being a requirement of the water management district. So right. we've, we've yes. discussed Hillsborough County, we've discussed Manatee County's review, but in addition to that, the same information is gonna be reviewed by the water management district. Is that correct? Correct, Mr. Chair, in conjunction with the environmental resource permit for this development. Okay. Yes. All right, very good. Um, it, and uh, I, I think it's also worth noting that this is above and beyond what is typically provided in Manatee County with regard to analysis, the, the storm frequency and, and duration. Well, the duration yes, is 24 Mr. hours, but yes. the frequency. It, it does incorporate both facets of Manatee County and Hillsborough County as far as the um, listing of the different storm events and the uh, rainfall district, uh, rainfall accumulation associated with each of those storm events, yes. Okay, very good, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any questions for staff? All right, very good. Uh, Mr. Neal, can you please uh, provide some clarity or additional information related to cul-de-sac length and um, the basis of the uh, special exception? <clears throat> I will, Mr. Chair, and, and we, we may not have com communicated effectively, and we will, the reason we typically at Neal ask for cul-de-sacs is to pr preserve wetlands. Traditionally at Neal, we do not destroy wetlands for residential development. In this case, we do not expect to. 
We believe that there's six places, which I'll mark now, that we think will require cul-de-sacs. But I will ask Rachel and uh, Jeb to create a study, and we will work with staff prior to the time we get to the board to make sure it's resolved. I'll show you, this, show you the six. The problem with wetlands is they're natural systems that we can't move. And so if we can't get a street back, then we just have to build a cul-de-sac. I think we'll make an adequate demonstration. I think your team will understand it. Very good. Thank you. And uh, uh, that's very helpful. I think um, when there's a, a request or um, a special exception or special approval, I'm sorry, um, the context is very helpful. And if it's to avoid impacting wetlands, I think that, um, that helps understand the reasoning behind it. So thank you. Would you like me to do a little rebuttal or shall I stand down and tell you? Um, first, let's go ask staff if there's any additional closing comments or information. Oh. Marshall Robinson, Development Services. We have nothing further. Very good. Thank you. All right. Mr. Neal or Mr. Grimes, uh, closing comments slash rebuttal. For the correct information, I'd like you to rely on Caleb. I'd like to talk a little bit about neighbors before we do so. We always traditionally do a good job with our neighbors, and we recognize our managing neighbors, and we'll do a good job with Mr. Hodgkins and Mr. Barnes. Uh, in truth, we've uh, missed this little uh, Manatee South group because they are separated by the 320-foot easement. I give you my commitment that I'll try to talk to Mr. Greenlee and see if we can resolve their Hillsborough County concerns. Caleb will go uh, much more technically through the um, presentation, I will say that we love working with Mr. Robinson. The fact that he was a Hillsborough County planner is terrific. We count on Marshall, and we know that his analysis is good. He's been a great hire for your de department, and we like working with him. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Caleb Grimes. Uh, just a, a few points that I want to address uh, just for the record so that we understand them. There were questions raised about lighting. And, you know, that used to be an issue, but our county has a very strict light code to prevent light pollution and light pollution in the sky. The, the, we're required. We no longer have the ones that shine up in the air. They have to shine down. They are not allowed to leave the perimeter of the development. So this project is not asked for any uh, change in that, and so it will have to follow the, the code to prevent the lighting from escaping. <clears throat> On the road system, I want to make sure that you understand, and I, you, you probably saw it, but with uh, Fort Hamer Road, that is going to be a very important road, Fort Hamer Extension, Mr. Neal, as he indicated, is building it up through his project, North River Ranches, up to the northern boundary of, or the northernmost access that he will use. And there is actually an LDA in place with Lennar that when they do their first phase that they will build uh, the remainder of that roadway all the way from his northern entrance all the way to Fort Hamer Road, uh, excuse me, Buckeye Road. That is in place, it is an agreement that has been put in place and they already have their first phase approval, so that will be going forward very soon. In that same LDA, as uh, Mr. Neal indicated, they will be uh, rebuilding Buckeye Road from Fort Hamer over to 301, and I think it's interesting that that will have a mobility trail associated with it and not just a sidewalk. Uh, but for all of the reasons that uh, John Neal explained about people walking and riding and so forth. And they, of course, have some uh, commercial in their site to capture those as well. Uh, and I did want to make sure there was a statement made about the water runoff with the roads, with the homes. The stormwater system that uh, Mr. Gerstenberg discussed and others must be built up front with your development, with your uh, plat, with your infrastructure improvements so that the stormwater system that is going to do all of the things Mr. Gerstenberger talked about is done before your homes uh, go in. Uh, finally, for Mr. Hodgins, I, 
Mr. Jones wanted to make it very, very clear that he does not claim any ownership of Pritchard Road. Uh, I will say that on some of the uh, maps, there's such of a scale that you can't see that. You see Pritchard Road and you see the uh, property line. But if you look at the detailed maps, Mr. Jones does not claim any ownership over Pritchard Road. It will not be changed. It will not adversely affect Mr. Hodgins' ability to uh, get to his property. So I uh, just wanted to make that very, very clear that there is nothing uh, being done with that or in any way to stop access uh, back there. And uh, finally, I just wanted to emphasize that the, uh, the TICO uh, uh, easement, that is the 320-foot easement between there, if you look at it on the maps and the aerials, it's a very wooded uh, piece of uh, land in there that will separate these developments. So you have that 320 plus the buffers that this proje project will have, plus the setbacks of the homes. Uh, from even the property lines to the north in Sundance. Uh, so that's the points I wanted to make. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them, but otherwise we look forward to your positive recommendation. Very good, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the uh, public hearing and open it up for discussion, deliberation, uh, thoughts on, on the uh, application. Mr. Chair, Mr. I'll make a motion. I move, to I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance Number PDMU 2032ZG and approval of the General Development Plan with stipulations A1 through A16, B1 through B7, C1 through C4, and D1. Adoption of finding for specific approval and granting specific approval for an alternative to the Land Development Code as, as presented by staff. Very good, and that's the uh, recommended uh, uh, the recommended motion yes, sir. that, that uh, allows for the cul-de-sac yes, sir. variation. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, we have a motion, is there a second? A second. So, Mr. Chair, just for the record, so that would be the first recommended motion. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. Very good. Uh, we have a motion, and a, Mr. Rutledge, I heard you second it. Yes, sir. Very good, thank you. Any discussion or deliberation? All right. I think we've uh, said a lot about this application. Um, so with that, the chair is going to call this to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5-0 with Mr. Um, Heap and Mr. Roth um, being absent. Thank you. So with, with that, I believe that concludes our agenda today. So I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, welcome to the Bradenton City Council meeting, 8.30 a.m. Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. I'm Mayor Gene Brown. Welcome to the City Hall Chambers. At this time, we'll ask Pastor Robert Bledsoe to come forward from Trinity United Methodist Church to say our invocation. Please stand. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we first and foremost give you thanks. Give you thanks for this new day for this chance to be together and to talk about matters that are important to uh, each and every person in this room and in our uh, wonderful city. God, we pray uh, that our words would be meaningful and well thought out and respectful, that we would treat one another with love in all of our